don't know how good their oversight is going to be, no matter how many subcommittees they create. If they're not enforcing their subpoenas, those subpoenas mean nothing. And Trump made it crystal clear in writing that he's going to continue his pattern of obstruction. Because when Trump signed the CARES Act into law, Trump wrote a signing statement that said that inspectors general will be supervised by the president, and he's already fired two of them, and that his administration will spend money as it sees fit without consulting with or getting approval from Congress. In fact, the signing statement listed a bunch of these oversight provisions and said, quote, my administration will continue the practice of treating provisions like these as advisory and non-binding, unquote. And what has Congress done about that? Nothing. Because again, I must harp on this, the 116th Congress controlled by both parties, they have handed a total of trillions of dollars to the Trump administration, and then they left Washington, D.C. for six weeks, and they still have not returned. I am so damn tired of being lied to. Hello, and thank you for listening to the 213th episode of Congressional Dish. I'm your host, Jennifer Briney, and I have spent the last three weeks reading the CARES Act, which is the most famous of the COVID-19 response laws so far. Now, this is the one that was super long, which is why it took me three goddamn weeks to read it. It was 335 dense pages of new law, and it was available for the Senate to read for less than an hour before it passed 96 to zero on March 25th. Then it moved into the House of Representatives, which had already been on vacation for two weeks at that point. But they passed it without a vote on March 27th. And if you want to know how that's even possible, go ahead and listen to the last main episode of Congressional Dish, number 212, where I geeked out on the process for all three of the COVID-19 response laws, none of which were crafted much more carefully than this one. But yes, today is the day that I'm going to tell you about a law that passed out trillions of our tax dollars, which was written pretty much by Mitch McConnell, Chuck Schumer, and the Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin behind closed doors. The vast majority of the people we elected, especially in the House of Representatives, were not involved in any way. In fact, in the House, they didn't even vote on it. And as always, when bills are written behind closed doors by the leaders of the Republican and Democratic parties, provisions that none of us want sneak their way into law. And this law was no exception. And so for this episode, I read every word of the new law, and I'm going to tell you what I found, my interpretation of it, and whatever follow-up information I was able to find, which is tough because we're finding out more and more every day, and the rules are changing every day. But because I'm not a lawyer, accountant, retirement fund expert, health insurance underwriter, or member of the Federal Reserve Board, because I am a taxpayer who's doing my best, but I'm not an all-knowing wizard... I'm giving you all of my sources that I used to create this episode. That includes a detailed outline of the law itself, because I won't be able to describe everything today. And I'm giving you a ridiculously long list of articles and documents so that you can jump down your own rabbit holes that I start you off on. Or you can simply verify that I'm not pulling this information out of my ass. This is what I do to earn your trust. And I welcome people checking my work. I don't consider it rude. Please do it. And also, if you are not one of the people who is getting financially rocked by the COVID-19 quarantines, please participate in the value for value funding model that keeps this show alive because you're not going to hear a single advertisement on this show and that's on purpose. The corporate media don't focus on exposing corporate favors granted by Congress because corporate money via advertisements is the hand that feeds them, literally. And it's generally a bad move to bite the money-filled hands that are feeding you. And so I have chosen to keep the advertisers out of this show completely. And instead, with the help of hundreds of producers, I create a show for you. I don't make money selling your time to companies. And so if you get value from this episode or any of the other 212 that I've produced in the last eight years, please use whatever payment method you like best to help produce this show. And we have lots of options. If you want to pay per episode, Patreon, per month, paper check, Zelle, PayPal. 
If you want to pay in lump sums and whatever amount you feel is fair and that you can afford right now, you can send in a paper check, Venmo, Zelle, Cash App, Chipotle gift cards. Whatever works for you works for me. And all of the options are listed in every episode show notes along with the sources for everything that I use. Also, if you want to submit a brief brief, guys, please, (laughs) a brief note to share with the community along with your contribution. All producers can have their notes read to the community on the thank you bonus episodes. And so thank you to all of the Congressional Dish producers. I said it in the thank you doctors episode, but I'll say it again. I feel like this moment is what I've been training for for all these years. I know better than most people that those in power never let a good crisis go to waste and they're not going to get anything past us this time. We might not be able to stop them in real time, but we can be aware of what they're doing in order to decide how to vote, work to repeal their worst defenses, and badger our representatives to make needed changes to programs that were designed quickly and poorly. We are not helpless, and understanding what is happening is the first step towards using our power. And we're going to take that first step, the understanding step, together today. But to really, truly get the most out of this episode, to understand it at the deepest level that I'm capable of explaining all of this, there are two episodes of Congressional Dish that you really should listen to first if you haven't already. And that is episode 201, which is about the Federal Reserve, and episode 199 about surprise medical bills. And I know it's annoying to be given homework assignments in a podcast, but the good news for you is that I love those two episodes. Those are two of my absolute favorites. And so I don't think you'll mind the homework, but those episodes will really help you to get the significance of some of the big stories I've chosen to focus on. And so if you want to get the full, most satisfying congressional dish binge experience, do that. But even if you don't, you'll be fine with just this episode. I'll do quick summaries to try to cliff notes you up to speed. Because after all, the cliff notes version of things got me through high school. And so it'll get you through the CARES Act. But those episodes, the Federal Reserve one, surprise medical bills, they're worth your time for sure. And before this episode will be helpful, for sure. But now let's get started with the CARES Act. And before I actually get into what it is, I do want to start off by telling you what it isn't, because this is good news and I don't want to bury it because the CARES Act is not the Patriot Act. Because after 9-11, like while the World Trade Towers were still smoldering, The short-sighted cowards in the 107th Congress passed a law that stomped all over our civil rights. It tried to legalize indefinite detention, which the Supreme Court did limit after the fact, but still it went further than we had before. The Patriot Act also created a wide range of powers that the executive branch could use against people suspected of broadly defined terrorism activities, largely destroying the idea of innocent until proven guilty. And it gave the government unprecedented spying powers, basically legalizing, at least for a while, the government collection of all of our digital data, essentially shredding the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. And almost 20 years later, we still haven't fought for and gotten those rights back. With the shameful, behind-closed-doors way that this law was written by people that we know we cannot trust, and the no time that was given to our senators to read it before it was passed, and the lack of a vote even happening in the House, well, I was really nervous about what rights they would take away from us in this law. And the good news is that there was nothing in here that takes away a single American right. If the COVID-19 crisis is going to be used to that end, that's still in the future, which means it can be stopped. And so if you're tuning into this episode today expecting to find out Patriot Act level scandals that are hidden in this law, you can rest easy. I won't be building up to some dramatic we're all f***ed conclusion. This bill could have been a lot, lot worse. That said, that doesn't make this law good because instead of this being a Patriot Act type of rights annihilating law, the CARES Act is more aptly compared to a robbery. It's like the CARES Act is a law directing the care bears to shoot money out of their bellies into Wall Street bank accounts, which most of us, I'm pretty sure, didn't vote for. But it won't directly lead to any of us being locked in a cage for no reason forever. So low bar, but this law did clear it. But there were still secrets, and one of them is getting absolutely no coverage at all outside of newsletters written by corporate law firms that are telling their pharmaceutical company clients how to take advantage of it. And so I want to get started with the -the over-the-counter drug, Dingleberry, because pretty sure you haven't heard of this before. So in 1972, a review system was created for reviewing over-the-counter drugs. Over-the-counter drugs are the kind that you can just 
buy. Like go to the grocery store or Walgreens or CVS, walk down the aisles, throw them in your basket, pay and go. You don't need prescriptions or a doctor's recommendation. You can treat yourself with your Advils and Tylenols and my personal favorite, NyQuil. Because there's nothing quite as sweet as a good NyQuil coma. You know what I mean? I know I probably shouldn't do this, but I sometimes take NyQuil just for fun to force myself to sleep like I'm dead. And I know I'm a real rebel with my drug abuse, but they call those kinds of drugs, the kinds you can just buy and abuse as you see fit over the counter drugs here in the States, even though we don't have to go to a counter to get them. So it can be confusing, but they are the common everyday drugs that most of us have in our homes right now. The system put in place in 1972 to ensure the safety of over-the-counter drugs was a process that required the government to review the ingredients, the doses, and the labeling on our medicines that we can buy without prescriptions. Well, the CARES Act completely rewrote the system for how those drugs get approved by the FDA in a way that, quote, lowers the regulatory burden, quoting from a corporate newsletter, on the drug companies. As in, it makes it a lot easier for companies to get their drugs approved and makes it a lot easier to ensure their profits. Now, before I get into the details, I do want to make my bias here clear because everyone has a bias, whether they admit it or not. And I have committed to be honest with you. And so here's mine. I want food and drug safety inspectors. I am a food and drug administration fan because like, I don't want to be that person that eats at a place without food inspectors who accidentally, I don't know, eats a bat and is global patient zero. I mean, can you imagine being plague person number one? Who's going to hang out with you if you're the disease that shut down the world? You know, that I don't want to be bat girl. And so food safety inspectors, good things. And they have to be on standby for everyone because it's unreasonable to expect every person to be able to afford to pay their own personal food safety inspectors. And so that's an appropriate function for government, in my opinion. And drug safety inspectors, same concept. I want to know what's in the pills I take or the NyQuil that I chug because it's quarantine Friday and my neighbor thinks he's a musician at 3 a.m. I want to be confident that someone made sure that it's safe for me to do that. And the process needs to be strong enough that if we end up with an administration filled with corporate hacks, we need to know that the process was so strong that it will ensure that they still have to do the reviews and can't just rubber stamp whatever is requested by their corporate sector business buddies. These are societal functions that we all need on standby. Again, I can't reasonably be expected to buy my own drug inspectors. And so this is an inherently government function. I am a fan of it and I want this process to work. That's my bias. And so here's how Congress changed the -the over-the-counter drug review process via Dingleberry in a bill that no one read. So the system for reviewing over-the-counter drugs revolves around the regulatory standards for the ingredients, which for some reason they decided a long time ago to name those standards monographs. And since that word confused the shit out of me while researching this, I'm not going to use it. I'm going to refer to those as standards, but for those of you in the know, the monographs are what I'm talking about. So the basic rules were that once the standards for an over-the-counter drug are developed, if a drug maker follows the standards for ingredients, then the drug that they are selling is not considered a new drug. So they can put it on the shelves without any review process by the FDA. So like when I go to Walgreens, I generally buy the Walgreens version of Advil, their version of ibuprofen. The ingredients are exactly the same, but the price for the Walgreens version is usually lower, sometimes a lot lower. Walgreens is able to sell me those pills because they are using the already reviewed standards. So that's why Walgreens, CVS, Kirkland, a bunch of companies can have their own versions of the drugs without having to go through the process of having their versions fully vetted by the FDA. But since that's how it works, it's super important that the standards themselves are carefully crafted since drug companies can use them to put drugs on our shelves without a review. The process for creating over-the-counter standards from 1972 until March 27th of this year was a three-phase public rulemaking process. Step one was that an advisory panel would review the ingredients to make sure that they were safe and effective for self-treatment and determine what needed to be told to us on the labels. In order to conduct the review, the drug company had to provide full reports on investigations showing whether or not the drug is safe and effective, the ingredients in the drug, where and how the drug is manufactured, and they had to provide samples of it. After that was complete, the advisory panel published their decision in the federal registrar and the public got time to comment on the panel's proposal. 
Then step two, the FDA at the agency level reviewed the drug using the panel's review, the public comments, and then any new data. The agency then produced a tentative final monograph, so tentative standards, and the public got time to comment again. Then step three, the FDA published their final order with the approved standards, assuming they were approved. In that final order, they would determine what category the drugs would be classified as. Category one are drugs that are safe and effective. Category two are drugs that are not safe and effective. And category three is a mess. That is the category that has insufficient data and there's all kinds of special rules. But the ultimate goal is to get all of the ingredients into the category one, safe and effective category, which allows the product to go to our shelves. Category two is basically a death sentence for the drug and category three, like I said, it's messy. Usually they require more testing and proof of safety until the category three situations work themselves out and the ingredient can be moved into category one. The problem that Congress was trying to solve is that the FDA and Health and Human Services, they're involved in this too, those agencies don't have a big enough staff to process these standards quickly. And so some drugs have been tentative and waiting for final approval for decades. And so the bottleneck was the point where the agency needed to finish the regulations. Now, the easiest solution to me seems to be to provide the agencies with more staff members to meet the demand. That was one option, but that's not what the Stingleberry did. Instead, they completely changed the FDA review process. And so instead of the three-step process that I just described, the CARES Act Dingleberry creates a new process that allows the Secretary of Health and Human Services, either on his own or at the request of a drug company, to issue an administrative order to determine if an ingredient is safe and effective, largely leaving the decision up to a political appointee. And right now, the Secretary of Health and Human Services is Alex Azar, a lawyer who made millions of dollars as the president of the U.S. division of Eli Lilly, which is a pharmaceutical multinational. Like I said, Alex Azar is a lawyer. He's not a doctor. And he's been a loyal Republican servant for almost his entire career. He started as a law clerk for Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia in the early 1990s. Then he worked on the Whitewater investigation against the Clintons with Kenneth Starr in the mid-1990s. Then he fought the Florida vote recount on behalf of George W. Bush after the 2000 election. Then after W. was appointed president, Azar was hired as a lawyer at Health and Human Services during the W. Bush administration. And that's the first time he interacted with the healthcare industry professionally in any way. It was only during the Obama years after the Republicans were booted out of the executive branch that Azar left government and became a pharmaceutical industry executive. And now he's in charge of health and human services in the clearly business beholden Donald Trump administration. And Alex Azar in a Dingleberry in the CARES Act was just given the power to largely control the process for reviewing and approving ingredients in over-the-counter drugs. Now, the safeguard in here is that he's not allowed to approve drugs if, quote, the evidence shows that the drug is not generally recognized as safe and effective, unquote, or that, quote, the evidence is inadequate, unquote. But that basically means that the drug has already gone through the real review process and was already determined unsafe or, well, the HHS secretary right now, Alex Azar, gets to define what is or what is not adequate evidence. So those safeguards, they're not really feeling too good to me. When a drug company wants a drug approved from here on forward, the advisory panel process and the requirements for what needs to be submitted by the companies as evidence of safety are gone. They also eliminated one of the two public comment periods. But if the government starts that review, this new process bends over backwards to help the companies keep the drugs on the shelves. So for example, let's say the HHS secretary starts a review with the intention of questioning if an ingredient in a drug is safe and effective. Well, if that's the case, the HHS secretary has to tell the drug companies what data they need to give him to show him that the drug is safe and effective and instructions on how to submit the data. The HHS secretary also needs to give the drug companies a six month comment period unless the HHS secretary thinks that, quote, a shorter period is in the interest of public health, unquote. And in the case that the HHS secretary pretty much knows that there's something dangerous in the drugs, there is a process for speeding up the process of issuing an order that would result in them being removed for the shelves, one that is shorter than six months. And that's in the case that a drug poses a, quote, imminent hazard to the public health, unquote. But even in that extreme circumstance, the HHS secretary still has to give the drug companies a 48 hours heads up before issuing an order. And the public comment period is 45 days before an order can be finalized instead of six months. And the HHS secretary gets to choose the effective date of that order, which is insane. 
Because every instance, the new process is clearly aimed at helping the drug companies keep drugs on the shelves. It's not designed to ensure unsafe drugs are removed as quickly as possible if that's not what the HHS secretary really, 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 really wants, who, again, is right now a pharmaceutical executive. These decisions are left up to him and him alone. But most of the time, it's going to be drug companies seeking approval for their drugs by getting the standards for that drug changed or inventing new drugs to begin with. And so a drug company can request a change or invent new standards of a drug if, one, they've added a new active ingredient to an already existing drug, or two, if company-conducted studies, if industry studies, show that an existing drug has a new use. So, and I know this is a pharmaceutical, but it's like all in the news right now, but like, let's use hydroxychloroquine as an example, because that's a malaria medicine that President Trump has been insisting lately might be effective in treating COVID-19. And we don't know if it is. In fact, there is some evidence that it is the exact opposite and that it's actually helping to kill people. But the point is that I don't trust Donald Trump on medical anything especially not after I found out that Donald Trump is invested in the company that makes hydroxychloroquine. But that's an example of a drug trying to show that it has a new use. It's used commonly to treat malaria. They want to say that it treats COVID-19. And so the new process, if a drug company wants to change the standards for a drug with a new ingredient or a new use, is that the company needs to submit an application and the HHS secretary has to determine if the company has met all of his requirements. The requirements are no longer listed in law. They're up to him. But if the company has met his requirements for making this request, if the company has not met his requirements, the company can demand that the HHS secretary review their application anyway, and the HHS secretary has to do it. Then if the HHS secretary using the new administrative order process that skips the advisory panel review in one of the two comment periods decides that the drug company's new ingredient is safe or that the drug can be used for a new purpose, the HHS secretary's final administrative order will authorize only that person or company that requested the review to market the drug for 18 months. The only changes that can't get the 18 month exclusivity is if the change is made to ensure safety or if they just changed the order of the ingredients list or added something wicked minor to the other category. And so basically, this is a brand new way for drug companies to stop competition on over the counter drugs, meet the requirements set by the currently pharmaceutical industry executive appointed by Trump to show a new use. And you don't have any competition for a year and a half. This language on the new use of over-the-counter drugs is apparently similar to the language that governs prescription drugs, and it's well known and has been for a long time that it's all kinds of legally murky. There are lawsuits galore about this. And so this Dingleberry expanded that known-to-be-broken system to over-the-counter drugs. Brilliant! And because, you know oversight, Congress did order a study on the impact of this new over-the-counter drug exclusivity and what that will have on customers, which is basically a legislative confession that they f***ing know that it will. <laughs> you know, if there's no competition, the prices can be rigged in the upward direction. That's how this goes. And so we'll at least get a study proving that to be true. Now, in the short term, there are a bunch of applications that have been in progress for a while now. And so what does this new law do with them? Well, the new law requires the HHS secretary to kill all the final standards that they were working on. And they will do this without notifying the public or allowing the public to comment. Any drugs that were tentatively deemed as safe and effective will be deemed approved. Any of them that were in the category two Tentatively, the, the not safe and effective ones, those are dead. They have to submit new applications unless the FDA takes specific action to allow the product to stay on the market. So there is some wiggle room here. And then the category three drugs, the ones with insufficient data, it depends. And if you're the one person who really cares about the details, that's what the show notes are for. There's more resources in there for you to jump down that rabbit hole, including the analyses by the corporate law firms, since no journalists seem to have found this provision in the law yet. But after the law was signed, Stephen Hahn, who's the current FDA commissioner, sent in a press release that they were so happy to get this done because they could innovate hand sanitizers in acetaminophen. But what's interesting is that the only over-the-counter drug specifically targeted in this law 
was sunscreen, which FYI is not related to helping battle COVID-19 at all. Now, this whole sunscreen thing started during the Obama years when Congress passed and Obama signed the Sunscreen Innovation Act, which forced the FDA to work on its backlog of applications from sunscreen manufacturers to introduce new sunscreen ingredients into the U.S. market. But it didn't work out the way the industry had hoped when they lobbied for that law. In 2015, the FDA rejected all eight applications that were pending for new sunscreen ingredients, telling the industry that they needed to provide more details about the new ingredients, that they needed to provide more evidence of safety before the FDA would be willing to classify the ingredients as safe and effective. And one senator in particular was pretty pissed about it. Here's then Senator Johnny Isaacson of Georgia questioning the FDA Commissioner Margaret Hamburg during a Senate hearing in March of 2015. I'm a victim of melanoma twice. Uh, the Surgeon General has issued a report that melanoma is costing America $8.1 billion a year in health. It's a major portion of his most recent statements. I hear very little from the FDA regarding that, and we worked hard on the Sunscreen Innovation Act, which passed Congress last year, to try and expedite the time and extent applications for ingredients to be approved for over-the-counter sunscreen products. We are still waiting for that to happen. You, can you tell me why the FDA is so reluctant to follow through on what Congress passed in terms of Sunscreen Innovation Act? Well, we are committed to following through, and of course, preventing uh, melanoma is a high priority, as well as developing exciting new treatments for melanoma, but prevention comes first. We do need to work with industry to get the data that we need to assess safety and effectiveness, and that is, of course, because these products are used uh, widely. Uh, applied often and hopefully with the right amount. They're used chronically and they, we need to understand about their absorption of these chemicals and what that means for safety and, and efficacy in the individuals using them, including, of course, many young children who may be you know, at, at greater risk in terms of chronic use. So we want to move forward. We want to have the American people have more options in terms of sunscreen products and the protection that it can afford. But we want to work with industry to make sure that the ingredients in those sunscreens actually work and that they're safe, especially for chronic use. My time is up, but I'd like to urge you to do everything you can to expedite the implementation of those approvals. Thank you very much. Three days after that hearing, the Wall Street Journal editorial board published an opinion stating that, quote, the only solution is to strip the sunscreen police of all powers over the stuff, unquote. And now fast forward four years later to 2019. The FDA, still working on their sunscreen standards, proposed reclassifying 12 ingredients as Category 3 drugs, the insufficient data category, something that the industry formally complained about in 2019 during the public comment period. The industry wanted 10 out of those 12 ingredients classified right away as Category 1. They wanted them to be deemed as safe. They also said that the proposed standards the FDA published last summer would have, quote, significant economic impact on the industry, unquote. They were specifically worried that they would have to create new formulas for sunscreens, pay to have them tested, and then they'd need new labels. Aww. On the side of the industry in this sunscreen battle were some notable Republican senators. Johnny Isaacson of Georgia was still on their team, as was Lamar Alexander of Tennessee. In May of 2019, these senators wrote a letter criticizing the FDA's proposed standards. Then in October of 2019, Johnny Isaacson introduced Bill S-2740, the Over-the-Counter Monograph Safety, Innovation, and Reform Act of 2019, which is the official name of this Dingleberry to the Cares Act from before it was in Dingleberry form. In the bill turned Dingleberry turn law that Isaacson wrote, it gives sunscreen companies with tentative approvals 180 days to decide if they want to stop their current applications and use the new, faster, less thorough administrative approval by our pharmaceutical executive turn HHS secretary instead. As part of this process, the sunscreen company is allowed to request and the HHS secretary must conduct a, quote, confidential meeting, unquote, so behind closed doors, with the companies to discuss what data they should submit to show that their ingredients are safe and effective. The effect of this is that the sunscreen companies are going to get to kill the application process that they have been unhappy about for half a decade and instead hand a pharmaceutical executive their fate since they're required by law to start this process in the next six months before the 2020 election and a possible new administration. 
And just like with over-the-counter drugs, the sunscreen provision provides 18-month exclusivity for a company that requests and receives a final administrative order from the HHS secretary that allows a sunscreen to have a new active ingredient. In addition, the new law allows drug companies, not just sunscreen companies, but all of them, to submit as evidence whether or not other countries allow those ingredients to be used in their countries. And this is a direct favor to the sunscreen industry, although it will help other drug companies too. But it's specific to sunscreens because many of the ingredients that the sunscreen industry wants to sell here are ingredients that have been used in other countries. Remember, these pharmaceutical companies are global. And so by regulation shopping, they'll be able to introduce products into the United States market that they otherwise might not be allowed to sell to us here in the States. In fact, they probably would not be allowed to sell them here based on recent FDA rulings against the sunscreen ingredients because of inadequate safety information. It's as clear a corporate favor as I've ever seen. And so how did this dingleberry hitch a ride into law on the CARES Act? Well... Senator Johnny Isaacson of Georgia, after years of advocating to the FDA on behalf of the sunscreen companies, wrote the bill, like I said, that gutted the -the over-the-counter drug approval process last fall. Then Senator Lamar Alexander of Tennessee, the Senate Health Committee chairman and the co-signer of that letter to the FDA protesting their decision against the sunscreen companies, well, he arranged for Isaacson's bill to get passed through his committee without a single hearing the very next day after it was introduced. The bill then passed the Senate 91 to 2 in December of 2019, making me question how many of them read it right before Christmas, but it never moved in the House at all. And since we know, as I described with all kinds of fury in the last episode, that the way this became law didn't allow the members of the House of Representatives at any time to read this before it became law, and they never worked on the bill when it was moving on its own, that means that a full half of Congress, the half that most directly represents the people, the House, never participated in the crafting of this new process for over-the-counter drug safety in any way. And as for the senators, who we know were responsible for this, for what it's worth, Johnny Isaacson from Georgia, he retired from Congress due to his Parkinson's disease two months after introducing this bill. So he's no longer there. But over the course of his congressional career, he took at least $690,000 from people in the pharmaceutical and health products industry. According to industry lobbyists who spoke to reporters at the Wall Street Journal, Republican senators added the sunscreen measures to this CARES Act bill to, quote, help establish Mr. Isaacson's legacy, unquote. How nice of them. And the chairman of the Senate Health Committee, who quickly used his power to move the bill late last year, Lamar Alexander, he's taken pretty much the same amount from people in the pharmaceutical industry as Johnny Isaacson. Lamar Alexander took at least $697,000. But I'm happy to report that he will be leaving Congress, too, this coming January. But even though those two were the most directly responsible, they weren't the only ones involved in dingleberrying this shameful new drug approval process into law. In 2019, there were 55 lobbyists walking around Capitol Hill getting paid to convince our lawmakers to get this new industry favor of a review process passed in the law. For example, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, Pharma.org, which represents companies in the pharmaceutical industry. Well, this bill was one of the many bills that they spent $12.5 million lobbying for in 2019. Then there's the Consumer Health Care Products Association, which represents manufacturers of -of over-the-counter drugs. They spent at least $666,000 on lobbying for this bill. Then there's GlaxoSmithKline, which is just one multinational pharmaceutical company. It's the company that makes Tums, Excedrin, Theraflu, Nicorette, some toothpaste, Lamisil for athlete's foot, Abriva for cold sores. Well, that one company spent $2.2 million lobbying for this bill in 2019. And then, of course, there's the Public Access to Sunscreens Coalition, which is a obviously a lobbying organization for sunscreens, because what fucking industry doesn't have a group of lobbyists? Well, they spent $210,000 lobbying for this favor to their industry, a favor that can't in any way be spun to be helping with COVID-19. And of course, that was far from the only corporate favor in the law. This is what you're tuning in here for. I got them for you. (laughs) And so now let's take a look at the other corporate favors that you're more likely to have heard at least something about in the last few weeks. So first, let's look at some tax provisions. 
There are some business tax credits in here that will benefit businesses that have been negatively affected by COVID-19 and can prove it. And that will cost about $54 billion. And I have no problem with those. But there are others in here that are favors to all businesses and some rich individuals, regardless of if COVID-19 affected them or not. And two of them are especially egregious. The first is a tax cut for corporations. So the IRS code has for many years allowed business losses to be carried over to following years. So the company's tax liability will be lower in the years to come. This law changes it so that business losses from 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021 can be carried backwards to each of the five years before the loss, while also allowing the existing option to carry the losses forward too. So it allows them to do a lot of moving money around to, uh, to game their tax liability. The law also removes the limit that said this couldn't be done to offset more than 80% of taxable income for 2018, 2019, or 2020, which means that this can be used to zero out these businesses' entire taxable income. In effect, this means that companies will be able to get refunds on taxes they already paid on taxes going far back as 2013. And in those years, from 2013 to 2017, corporate tax rates were higher. And so reducing their income levels retroactively lets the corporations get more money back from those higher tax years. And there's no requirement that the businesses that get this tax gift prove that they were in any way negatively affected by COVID-19. This one provision is estimated to provide $25.5 billion to corporations that may or may not have been affected by COVID-19 at all. The second tax cut is a straight up gift for rich individuals, especially those in real estate. Because prior to the 2017 Republican tax cut law, individual taxpayers could deduct unlimited business losses against other kinds of income. In an attempt to balance out some of the other tax favors to the rich that were included in the 2017 tax cut law, that law changed the tax cut so that losses could only be used to shelter the first $250,000 for a single person or $500,000 of a married couple's non-business income, such as capital gains from stock market bets. This law retroactively removes those limits that were imposed by the 2017 tax law going back to 2018 and until 2021. In effect, this will allow individuals with at least $250,000 in income to submit amended returns and get refunds that weren't allowed in 2018 and 2019. In reality, this is going to allow wealthy investors, stock market gamblers, to use losses generated by depreciation in real estate, which are on paper losses. Often, real estate values go up, not down. Well, real estate investors can use those on paper real estate depreciation losses to minimize their taxes on profits from things like their investments in the stock market. And again, no harm from COVID-19 needs to occur in order to benefit from this provision. And the way this works in real life, let's just do a fun little example, is well illustrated in the real life of a man you've probably heard of by now, Jared Kushner, President Trump's son-in-law. Over the past decade, the Kushner family has spent billions of dollars buying real estate. As of 2018, Kushner's net worth was estimated to be about $324 million. But despite his obvious wealth, Kushner paid little or no federal income taxes for at least half of the last decade because of this particular tax loophole that was just reopened for obscenely rich people like himself. Jared Kushner and his company, despite not having lost any actual money, reported depreciation on their buildings, on paper losses for buildings that in reality were just as valuable, in fact, probably more valuable. They didn't lose their value. But that tax code gift allowed them to zero out his tax liability, which was perfectly legal until tax year 2018. And even though he had to pay taxes when the loophole was closed, he's going to get a fucking refund now for the taxes he paid in 2018 and 2019, as if the law was never changed. According to an analysis done by the Joint Committee on Taxation after this gift became law, because that was the only time they could do the analysis, they didn't have time to do it beforehand. Well, that nonpartisan office concluded that 82% of the benefits from these tax changes will go to Americans who make over a million bucks per year. A tax refund that will give them about $90 billion in their pockets in 2020 alone. $90 billion this year alone. 
And if you want someone to blame, we know exactly who put these provisions in the law. Senate Republicans, aim your fire at them. In total, these favors to the rich slipped into the law by the party that brands itself as fiscally conservative will cost us $195 billion. And it's a cost because much of the money, like I said, will be refunds on taxes already paid. And so $195 billion in non-COVID-19 related tax favors to the rich. Let's keep that number in our heads for the rest of the episode to compare it to what was spent on some other things. Even though that $195 billion is just a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of money that this law hands to Steven Mnuchin. Because as pretty much everyone has heard by now, if you've cared enough to research anything related to the CARES Act, the CARES Act gives the Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, one of the three main authors of this law, even though he's not in Congress, well, behind closed doors, he negotiated himself an authorization to use $500 billion to make loans, which would need to be paid back. Loan guarantees, which are loans that bankers issue and make profits off of, but that taxpayers pay for if the business can't pay it back. And, quote, other investments, unquote, which is pretty fucking vague, which means that Steven Mnuchin is authorized to basically give money to companies. He'll make his own deals, and there's no requirement that they be fair ones or that the money be returned. Now, out of this $500 billion, $46 billion has to be directed towards the airlines, and $454 billion will be used by Steven Mnuchin and the Federal Reserve to give to, well, that's the thing. They get to decide. And that's really not an exaggeration. The money can go, it's allowed to go, to state and local governments and to, quote, eligible businesses, unquote, which are specifically in the law, air carriers or, quote, a United States business that has not otherwise received adequate economic relief in the form of loans or loan guarantees provided under this act, unquote. And who determines what is adequate economic relief? Steven Mnuchin. And so the money can go to any business that Steven Mnuchin determines needs the money. And for what can he give them the money? Quote, Losses directly or indirectly as a result of the coronavirus, as determined by the secretary, unquote. And so Stephen Mnuchin decides what's covered as a loss. And Congress could have made those decisions and put them in the law. Congress could have required what losses would mean. For example, for some of the business tax credits, businesses have to show that their revenue is significantly lower this year than it was in 2019 to be eligible. Congress could have made that a qualification for all of the COVID-19 money for businesses, but they didn't. This $500 billion and what it can be spent on is at the discretion of one man, the Treasury Secretary, who, again, is not an elected person, and he was one of the three people behind the closed doors when this law was written. That by itself is scandalous. But the thing is that the $454 billion that will be handed out to all businesses that are not airlines is much more than it seems because of the way the Federal Reserve works. In the Federal Reserve episode, which hopefully you've listened to by now, (laughs) but we all learned that the Federal Reserve basically creates money out of thin air because it's allowed to lend out $10 for every dollar that it has, which means that nine of those dollars are poof, brand new. If the Federal Reserve doesn't get paid back, that new money stays in our system, which makes each existing dollar worth a little less. And that adds up. And so that creates a hidden tax on all of us called inflation. We see it as higher prices. We blame the businesses that increase their prices. But the reality is that inflation decreases the value of our money itself. The amount of stuff that we can buy with the money in our checking accounts. It's a very clever trick. It's a brilliant and evil way of taxing us citizens without most of us understanding that we're even being taxed. And by giving the Treasury Secretary and the Federal Reserve $454 billion, because of the accounting gimmicks the Fed can play, because they can lend out $10 for every dollar they have, that $454 billion can be used to hand out over $4.5 trillion to whoever the hell they want to. And like I said, not all of that is going to be loans. Some of that, we don't know how much, will be loan guarantees. And if the businesses can't pay the bankers back, the Fed doesn't get the money back, which means the money stays in the system, which means inflation. And of course, some of the money, again, we don't know how much, will be in the other investments category. And the Fed is likely to never see that money again, 
which also leads to the hidden tax called inflation. And so we will pay for this, not only in taxes used to fund the 500 billion of startup money for them, but also with diminished value in our bank accounts. And so if that's the case, we had better hope that Congress put some strong strings on how this money could be spent to make sure that it would go to help the businesses and the people hurt by COVID-19 and not just be used to pad the balance sheets of well-connected companies and companies that made bad business decisions and were hurting due to their own greed and competence or both. Well, spoiler alert, Congress didn't do that. So first, let's take a look at the airlines. Because even though hotels and restaurants, hair salons, nail salons, massage parlors, public transportation systems, Uber, Lyft, and other businesses that require humans to be in close contact with each other to operate are all basically closed right now, airlines got $46 billion guaranteed to be given to them. $17 billion of that is directed to go to, quote, businesses critical to maintaining national security, unquote, which the Washington Post reported is worded to direct that money to Boeing in particular. Boeing is the maker of the 737-8 MAX, the plane that's been grounded for like a year because two of them fell out of the sky and killed hundreds of humans. And those Boeing planes to this day are still not considered safe to fly. At this point, there is plenty of whistleblower testimony and articles to prove that Boeing cut corners, putting their profits over our safety. My name is Ed Pearson. I retired from the Boeing company in August of 2018 as a senior manager at the 737 factory in Renton, Washington. On June 9th, 2018, while the Lion Air airplane was being produced four months before it crashed, I wrote an email to the 737 general manager advising him to shut down the production line to allow our team time to regroup so we could save the planes. During this time frame, the 737 factory was in chaos. Every single factory health metric was getting record low marks, and each one was trending in the wrong direction. Following that email, I requested a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the general manager on July 18th and repeated my recommendation to shut down the factory for a brief period of time. When I mentioned that I've seen operations in the military shut down for lesser safety concerns. I will never forget his response, which was, the military isn't a profit-making organization. Keep in mind that on October 29, 2018, when the Lion airplane crashed killing 189 people, it was only two months old. After the crash, I wrote a letter directly to Boeing's chairman, president, and CEO, Dennis Mullenberg. Mr. Mullenberg asked his general counsel communicate with me, and we spoke on three occasions where I renewed my warnings. On February 14, 2019, the Boeing's assistant general counsel assured me that Boeing had seen nothing that would suggest the existence of embedded quality or safety issues. I wrote a follow-up letter with supporting documentation to Boeing's board of directors requesting that they take urgent action, but received no response. Less than a month later, on March 10, 2019, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 crashed, killing 157 people. That airplane was only four months old. That was December 11th in the House Transportation Committee. Just four months ago, Boeing was in the hot seat for their profit over safety business decisions and was and is still hemorrhaging money because they have been unable to deliver the unsafe planes to the airlines. Boeing has already had to pay Southwest Airlines $125 million to offset Southwest losses caused by Boeing's bad business decisions. And that's just the first settlement. There will be more to come. Boeing's business was in big trouble because of their own business choices. They didn't take Airbus seriously as competition when they announced their more fuel-efficient Airbus A320. And when Airbus overtook Boeing as the world's largest seller of passenger aircrafts, Boeing rushed the production of a new, more fuel-efficient plane that wasn't really new but was a half-assed tweak of their old plane, a rushed redesign that went horribly wrong. In a free market, if that were a real thing, Boeing might fail, and deservedly so. But the problem is that Boeing's business is much bigger than the commercial jets that us peasants use to get around. Boeing is a major war industry manufacturer, and our country is fighting a lot of wars. Boeing gets over $20 billion per year in tax money from our government for airplanes, satellites, communication equipment, helicopters, rockets, missiles, and drones. The U.S. government is Boeing's largest customer, accounting for over 30% of Boeing's revenue in 2018. 
But as much as Boeing depends on our taxes for its income, the more important problem is that our government, the war wing of it in particular, is now dependent upon Boeing. Boeing is the second largest source of our war equipment. Only Lockheed Martin provides more. Boeing provides the war makers in our government with about 20 percent of their weapons, which means that Boeing is too integrated into our government to fail. And so our members of Congress, who are also financially dependent on Boeing for their campaign contributions, Boeing affiliates have already passed out three million dollars to Republicans and Democrats for 2020 elections alone. Well, those members of Congress saved Boeing by basically paying them a year's worth of tax money that they usually get, but this time for nothing in return. The rest of the money for the airlines, $32 billion, has to be used, quote, exclusively for the continuation of payment of employee wages, salaries, and benefits, end quote. The companies that take the money, the airlines that take the money, can't furlough their workers or reduce their wages until September 30th, but after that, they're free to do so. The payments to the airlines had to be made within 10 days of signing this law, and so the airlines got paid by April 6th. I am recording this on April 25th, and my hairdresser friend is still waiting for her $1,200 stimulus check. She has to pay her second Bay Area rent payment since being forced to stop working just next week. And that $1,200 will not even cover half of the rent that she owes when it finally does arrive. But the airlines, they got their cash and they got it quick. Priorities. And as for the rest of the businesses that will be getting loans and just handed money from the $454 billion to $4.5 trillion fire hose of money from Steven Mnuchin and the Fed, well, here's the basic extent of the rules that Congress put in place on their fire hose. If the Treasury Secretary, Steven Mnuchin, chooses to loan money directly to a business, the business cannot pay out dividends to people who bet on the company in the stock market or buy its own stock until one year after the loan is paid back. In the case of the airlines, they can't hand money to stock market gamblers or buy their own stock until September 30th, 2021, if they take the money. The reason that they prohibit companies from buying their own stock is that when executives choose to use company money to buy the company's own stock, it has the effect of raising the stock price. Executives often get a significant amount of their pay in stock, and so doing so raises their own incomes and the incomes of the people who bet on the company in the stock market who are not workers essential to keeping the company in operation most of the time. Buying back stock also has the effect of reducing the amount of cash the company has saved up in case of, oh, I don't know, a global pandemic, increasing the need for government bailouts when their business temporarily dries up. So Congress, the Democrats in particular on this one, they fought for that to be disallowed at least for a little while in return for taking our money. They also require that the companies keep their full workforce until September 30th, 2020, and the company can't cut more than 10% of its workforce after that if they take our money. And there's another way Steven Mnuchin can lend out money, too. Basically, Steven Mnuchin will set up like a side bank that it uses to lend banks money to lend to businesses with between 500 and 10,000 employees at a maximum 2% interest rate, which can't accrue for the first six months. The businesses that get that money will have to keep 90% of their workforce through September 30th with the same rules on no stock buybacks, no dividends for the length of the loan plus a year. But also the businesses can't offshore any jobs for two years, change any collective bargaining agreements for two years, or stop their workforce from forming a union. So there are more rules for businesses that get their money from banks instead of directly from Steven Mnuchin. For all the loans issued by Steven Mnuchin at Treasury, there are limits on the amount of money that an executive of that business that gets a Treasury Department loan can get. The limit is that the executives can get $3 million plus half of whatever they got over that $3 million in 2019 for the length of the loan plus a year, which, I'm sorry, that's not that much of a limit. So, for example, if an executive got $20 million in 2019, they can get $11.5 million paid for with the money we're loaning them. And, you know, in what universe is $3 million, just a measly $3 million, not enough for an executive paper pusher? Like, why do they need to get so much extra? But that's what the millionaires who wrote this law consider fair for their executive friends. That's a limit for in their minds. And so that's the rules for loans issued directly by Treasury or funneled through banks. 
However, the rules are different for direct loans to businesses made by the Federal Reserve, which, by the way, are usually illegal. Usually the Federal Reserve is the banker's bank. It's supposed to lend money to banks, which then lend money to businesses. But because this is an emergency, direct loans to businesses from the Federal Reserve are being allowed. And so if the Fed issues the loan, the same rules theoretically apply. No stock buybacks, no dividends for a year after the loan is paid back, except for these Federal Reserve loans. Steven Mnuchin is allowed to waive those restrictions for any reason he wants to, which means that those restrictions aren't really law when the Federal Reserve issues loans to businesses. All Mnuchin has to do is tell Congress the reason he waived the restrictions. That's it. That's your oversight, folks. And the requirement that the businesses not fire anybody aren't there at all for Federal Reserve loans. And that's the thing. The story here isn't really about what's in the law, but instead what isn't. For Federal Reserve loans, which those are going to big businesses, like who has a direct line to the Federal Reserve? Like definitely not my hairdresser friend. So for those Federal Reserve loans, there are no restrictions placed by Congress on what the businesses can do with the money. There's no requirement that the money go to employee paychecks or benefits or even the company's bills. There's no prohibition on companies large enough to get direct loans from Treasury or the Fed from using the money to buy small businesses, to put small businesses out of business. There's no prohibition that the money not be used to pay off debts from their own bad business decisions that were on the books before COVID-19. And on top of that, the Federal Reserve and Steven Mnuchin have the ability to make, quote, other investments, unquote, which in reality translates into them buying up bonds and debt and other financial industry garbage. In fact, the Fed, for the first time ever, is buying corporate bonds that are labeled literally junk. And this is possible because... Well, first of all, as we know, Congress didn't bother to place any restrictions on what Steven Mnuchin and the Fed could do. But also the management of the fire hose of money, it's not even being done by them. They were allowed to contract it out. So the law gives Steven Mnuchin $100 million for administration, which means it's $100 million to hire others to hand out our money. And the Fed has that option too, and they're using it. So like BlackRock is one company that has gotten multiple contracts for a piece of that $100 million from the New York Fed, which is the Wall Street branch of the Fed, which is by far the most powerful one. They got contracts to manage at least three different programs, including the one that manages the loans to big businesses. What's so crazy about this is that BlackRock is going to be using Fed money to buy corporate bonds. But BlackRock also sells corporate bonds. So BlackRock is going to be buying with other people's money and selling in the same market, which gives them enormous power to set prices if they want to, because they're going to be playing both sides. Conflict of interest is an understatement. They can use America's money to pay off their own bad bets, to buy their own shitty bonds, and then charge us taxpayers a fee to do it. And there's some evidence that the conflict of interest of BlackRock being buyers using Fed money in a market that they're sellers in is being profited from. So, for example, BlackRock has a $30 billion corporate bond fund, which is like a package of long-term bets on corporations. Stock market gamblers, investors, have been hitting big by betting on long-term corporate bonds. But in a pandemic, when long-term planning is, as we all know, impossible to do, Long-term anything is tough to sell. And so the BlackRock corporate bond fund, as makes sense, was going down during COVID apocalypse. So on Friday, March 6th, this is like before the shit hit the fan, the share price of BlackRock's fund was $134. But on Thursday, March 19th, the week before this law was signed, it had dropped to 105 But now, magically, even though long-term planning for many corporations remains just as impossible as it was in March, well, look at that. The stock price is back to around 130, almost right back to where it started. Hmm. Hmm. What happened in between? Well, could it be possible that the thing that made the difference is that BlackRock got the ability to spend Fed money on corporate bonds like the bonds that BlackRock sells? Hmm. I have some questions about that. If only there was a branch of 
government that had the ability to do oversight. If only there was a group of people directly hired by the people to do just that. Oh, oh wait, there is. There is. It's Congress. Congress is supposed to be doing oversight on this, but mm, they're still on vacation. Hmm. What a pity. And so that's a huge problem (laughs) because there's a lot we don't know and no one is doing their jobs to find out because without Congress around to do their jobs, we peasants can only kind of police the Treasury through investigative journalism because the Treasury has to do some reporting requirements. The Treasury Department has to tell us who's getting Treasury loans, how much loans are for and a copy of the final term sheet, which is good. But the Federal Reserve, Congress allowed the Federal Reserve's dealings to remain a black hole. Disclosure requirements for the Fed do not require the name of the business or the terms of the loan. If we get that money, it's going to be because the Fed wants to give it to us. And so we aren't required to get the most basic of information. And even worse, Congress, through the CARES Act, let the Federal Reserve out of some of the weak reporting requirements that they usually have, reporting requirements that people fought for for many decades to put in place. And so what Congress did is they said from March 13th until either the end of the COVID emergency or December 31st, Congress exempted the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve from the requirements that they give us public peasants a day's notice before their meetings and that they make the minutes of their behind closed doors meetings public. And these are meetings where they determine the monetary policy of the United States. No small matter. Instead, the Fed will only have to keep a record of their votes and the reasons for their votes, which might be released to the public later. I say might because there's no requirement that they ever be released. But, you know, maybe if we say pretty please. And so this part private part government cabal of bankers gets to choose what we will and will not be told about what they're doing with America's money. It's absolute madness and it's all Congress's fault. They had the power to require more reporting. Instead, they gave the Fed more power to keep their actions secret, preventing anyone from objecting to their decisions in real time. So, in summary, lots of money, loads, if you will, (laughs) is going to be handed out by Steven Mnuchin, the Federal Reserve, and the companies they'll pay with our money to hand out our money, with very few restrictions put in place by Congress by law. But there were some restrictions, and so who's going to police any of this? Well, the strongest oversight in the new law comes in the form of a pandemic response accountability committee that will investigate and report on the use of COVID-19 funds through September of 2025. The committee will be operated by two full-time paid employees, and the other members will be inspectors generals from at least nine federal agencies, which is a good thing because inspectors general are government employees who specialize in conducting oversight of government. The important thing is that this committee will have enforceable subpoena power. They can force people to testify. The committee is allowed, but not required, to hold public hearings. So I don't know if I'll ever be able to play the clips for you. But the committee will have a public website that's required to provide their findings, data, some contracting information, and the division of the COVID-19 funds by state and congressional district. The problem with this committee is that Donald Trump has the power to f*** with it, and he already has. Already, within a month of this becoming law, Trump has, let's say, removed the head of this committee, a man named Glenn Fine, who has been an inspector general in our government for the last 15 years. Trump transferred him to a different job where he won't be involved with overseeing the COVID-19 money. Trump also replaced the inspector general of the Treasury, one of the members of this committee, with one of his personal lawyers. So the oversight committee with the most actual power to police the Trump administration wasn't protected from President Trump, a man we all know loves to fire people that he doesn't consider loyal. So I don't have a lot of hope in that one. The next bit of oversight is a provision that creates an inspector general within the Treasury Department who will be appointed by the president. So that right there, appointed by the president. Nopesy dopesy, not getting oversight there. And then the last provision for oversight creates a Congressional Oversight Commission whose job is to conduct oversight of the implementation of this law by the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve. And the way this law is written, they're going to have their work cut out for them. Because what they're supposed to do is find out how the Treasury Secretary, so Mnuchin, and the Federal Reserve Board are using the money that they've put in charge of, 
They're supposed to tell us the impact of the loans, loan guarantees, and the straight cash given to banks and companies. They need to report on the effect that the weak-ass reporting that was required of them will have on the market. And they also have to report on the effect of the loans, guarantees, and the other investments in companies. They have to report on the effect that those had to us taxpayers. And so in order, this was the order it was in. The commission has to investigate where the money go, the impact on the market, the level of secrecy, and the effect on the taxpayers. We are listed last. (laughs) Of course. The way this commission is created, Trump has no authority to fire the members because all five members will be people selected by members of Congress, not Trump, which is a good thing. But unlike the committee made up of inspectors general, this commission has no subpoena power, so they can't force anyone to testify. And so what that means is we have one oversight commission with power, but no independence and another commission with independence, but no real power. Awesome, guys. Really good job crafting this law. Also, this independent of Trump but powerless committee is not required to have public hearings, but they're allowed to. So it really depends on who the chairman is and what that person decides. And if they do, they're allowed to swear in witnesses, but they're not required to question people under oath. Regardless of this commission's relative powerlessness, the due date on their first report is early May at the latest, which is only a week away as of this recording. And that's a problem because the commission, almost a month after this law was signed, still hasn't been fully created yet. Another thing we can blame 100 percent on the leadership in Congress, Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell specifically. Because the commission's going to have five members. One's appointed by the speaker, so Nancy Pelosi. One by the House Minority Leader, Kevin McCarthy. One by the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell. One by the Senate Minority Leader, Chuck Schumer. And the chairperson is co-appointed by the speaker and the majority leader, which are Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell. So this law was signed on March 27th. The first person appointed was a man named Bharat Ramamurthy. Ramamurthy. <laughs> you know how I am with names. I suck at them. And uh, yeah. So Mr. Ramamurthy, we're going to go with that, was picked on April 6th. Now, he's the Chuck Schumer pick, and he was an economic advisor to Elizabeth Warren. And people seem to forget sometimes why Elizabeth Warren is famous. It's not because she has a dog. She basically invented the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau when she was put in charge of a similar commission created after the bankers gambled away the world's economy during the W. Bush years. In that role, even though her commission was similarly powerless with no subpoena power and no authority to write laws, the Elizabeth Warren Commission served to tell us what the bankers did with our money, and they did a pretty decent job. Elizabeth Warren at that time saw the role of the commission as an educational one, and Ramamurthy said that he sees his role the same way. And so I think he is a great pick for the commission, and look at that. Chuck Schumer did something right. But then, after April 6th, No one else was chosen. And so in frustration, Ramamurthy opened a Twitter account to communicate with the public, which is an excellent follow, by the way. And when no one else had been appointed to the commission for 10 days, he wrote an editorial that was published in the New York Times demanding that the rest of the commission be appointed. After all, the actual least Congress can do while they're on vacation is staff the commission that's going to do the oversight in their absence. And so two days after Congress was publicly shamed nationwide, Nancy Pelosi finally put down her ice cream and made her pick for the commission. And she picked a freshman congresswoman from Florida named Donna Shalala. Donna Shalala, which, by the way, I could say that name all day. Donna Shalala, Donna Shalala, Donna Shalala, Donna Shalala. I love it so much. It's so fun to say. (laughs) Well, Donna Shalala used to be the Secretary of Health and Human Services during the Clinton years which would be great experience to have if this commission were overseeing health care, but it's not. This is the one that's supposed to oversee the fire hose of money being sprayed by Steven Mnuchin in the Federal Reserve at Wall Street. And this woman has no expertise in that area and doesn't sit on any of the committees that oversee financial services. She does, however, have some knowledge about the finances of some of the big businesses that will be showered with money from the Federal Reserve money hose because Shalala owns, or at least recently owned, a shitload of stock in many of those companies. Now, she may have sold some of those stocks recently, but it's unclear because she violated the Stock Act requirements that survived the 2013 gutting of that law. And she didn't report all of her recent trades. And so what that means is that Nancy Pelosi's pick for the Oversight Commission blew off required oversight of her own stock trades. Not great. 
But until recently and possibly currently, Shalala has owned a lot of stock in the health insurance titan United Health, where she sat on the board for six years. She also has stock in Boeing, a recipient of at least $17 billion from this law. She owns stock in fossil fuel titans ConocoPhillips, Chevron, Royal Dutch Shell, and Occidental. She owns stock in entertainment companies that are hurting, such as AMC Movie Theaters, Paramount, and the company that sells tickets to stadium events, Live Nation. She also owns stock in Choice Hotels, TripAdvisor, and a bunch of retail stores that can't open their doors right now. And of course she owns stock in a bunch of banks. J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of New York Mellon, and HSBC. In fact, that BlackRock fund that I told you about, the long-term corporate bond fund that is doing surprisingly well now that BlackRock is in charge of handing out the Fed's money, well, Donna Shalala owns stock in funds in the BlackRock web too. And that only scratches the surface of her personal financial entanglements with Wall Street because her list of stocks is 26 pages long. As if those aren't red flags enough. Shalala is also on the Council on Foreign Relations, the global organization full of filthy rich friends of multinational businesses, and she ran the Clinton Foundation for two years. Although the people in the club, like Nancy Pelosi, considered those resume items to be good things instead of red flags, which is precisely the problem. So that was Pelosi's pick for the Oversight Commission, despite the fact that Katie Porter, who has a ton of experience, Katie Porter is a congresswoman from Irvine, California. She has a ton of experience in financial services and is excellent at questioning witnesses. We heard her very recently in the uh, the first coronavirus episode, episode 211. That was Katie Porter. She's so good at questioning witnesses. And she was actively seeking the job. She said, I want it. Porter would have been the perfect pick for this if the goal were to actually find out what Mnuchin and the Fed were doing with our money. Ice Cream Nancy, however, chose a member of the Council on Foreign Relations who is hopelessly devoted to big business stocks instead. The resistance! The resistance! Are we done with Nancy Pelosi yet? And so those are the two picks that were destined to be the most interested in true oversight. We're one out of two. As for the Republican picks, well, Kevin McCarthy picked a banker, because of course he did, a banker turned congressman named French Hill of Arkansas, who thought that the 2008 bank bailout had, quote, too many strings attached, unquote. (laughs) And Mitch McConnell picked the best buddy of big business, Senator Pat Toomey. But I would expect no better of the Republicans in Congress at this point. The chairman, though, almost a month after the law was signed, still hasn't been selected by Pelosi and McConnell. And so that commission, one out of the five people, I have faith in. So it's not looking good. Plus, the commission doesn't really have power. So not looking good. And then, as a little cherry on top, just this week, the House of Representatives sort of came back to vote to create a subcommittee on the Committee on Oversight and Reform. So this will be like an actual congressional committee dedicated specifically to COVID-19. But that committee is completely useless as long as Congress remains on vacation, which they still are. And well before this crisis, Trump has ordered executive branch employees to defy congressional subpoenas for documents and testimony. And the thing is that not a single one of their asses has been thrown in a cage for defying Congress by the sergeant at arms. And so even when Congress comes back from vacation... I don't know how good their oversight is going to be, no matter how many subcommittees they create. If they're not enforcing their subpoenas, those subpoenas mean nothing. And Trump made it crystal clear in writing that he's going to continue his pattern of obstruction. Because when Trump signed the CARES Act into law, Trump wrote a signing statement that said that inspectors general will be supervised by the president, and he's already fired two of them, and that his administration will spend money as it sees fit without consulting with or getting approval from Congress. In fact, the signing statement listed a bunch of these oversight provisions and said, quote, my administration will continue the practice of treating provisions like these as advisory and non-binding, unquote. And what has Congress done about that? Nothing. Because again, I must harp on this. The 116th Congress controlled by both parties, Dems have the House, the Republicans have the Senate. They have handed a total of trillions of dollars to the Trump administration, and then they left Washington, D.C. for six weeks, and they still have not returned. Congress is one of the three co-equal branches of the federal government, and overseeing the actions of the executive branch is one of their most basic responsibilities. 
During this time when oversight is badly, badly, badly needed, they abandon Washington, D.C., and every single one of us should be absolutely livid about this. They left the response to a global pandemic 100% in the tiny hands of Donald Trump. And the Democrats, the Democrats, they have correctly insisted that Donald Trump cannot be trusted because he lies. We know he lies. And he has a long history of making decisions based on his own personal relationships, business interests, and what the media is saying about him. And the Democrats, we gave them control of the House of Representatives in 2018. We showed up to vote and we said, here, take a branch of the federal government so that someone will police the Trump administration. That was a big motivation for a lot of us. I know for a fact that it was. And so the House of Representatives, it's the only branch of the federal government that they have any real power in right now. And they voluntarily surrendered that oversight tool since the beginning of the quarantines. They could have and should have been in Washington, D.C. this entire time. They voted just this week. It took 90 minutes in the House of Representatives to vote instead of the usual 15 because they did the social distancing thing. They called people in based on their last names and they voted one by one. Took a little bit longer, but they got it done. And a rules committee hearing was held. It was boring. I don't have any clips for you. But there was a witness and they did it in the largest hearing room with lots of space between members and the witnesses. And they could have been doing that the whole time. They didn't have to scatter all over the country and not come back. Like I said, they voted this week and they don't need to stay on vacation for another week. They had to come back to vote. So why the f*** aren't they back at work right now? Why are they waiting for May 4th? If they even come back on May 4th, I don't really have faith that they're coming back then either. This is absolutely unforgivable to me. And every time I see Trump do something absurd, like ask Dr. Burks to look into the idea of injecting disinfectant into our lungs to fight COVID-19, I think Congress left us with this guy 100% in charge, with no one to police him. No oversight. It's unforgivable. And they're still on vacation. It's been six weeks. I cannot handle that. It's been six weeks. Six weeks. <laughs> six weeks. <sighs> That's a long time to be required to stay home. <laughs> I might be going a little bat just like everybody else. But what's more important than the bat of my mental state is that it's crushing small businesses all over the country. Crushing. And so I want to start talking about the small business loans because it's made news because it should. And I have some answers for you about why it's been such a cluster. As I was reading this law and I was thinking of small businesses, I've been thinking most often of the 1400 bar and grill here in Alameda. I actually moved to Alameda because I enjoyed this particular restaurant so much. They have a big, sunny, dog friendly patio and a you know, Bay Area affordable bottomless mimosa brunch on weekends with amazing food served until 2 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. It's my happy place. And they also have staff members that I would be friends with. They're cool people. The owner's from Hawaii, so there's a very Aloha vibe there. They have Spam fries, which this Weight Watcher doesn't eat, but I love that I serve them because Hawaii was home for me for years. And so I still have Ohana in the islands and Aloha in my heart for sure. And when I think of the 1400, I've had so many fun times there. Like I discovered Alameda because we went to the 1400 for my birthday a few years ago. I've gone there for Patriots games. There's always a few Pats friends there, although we'll have to see how many of them are still wearing their Pats jerseys after Brady and Gronk moved to Tampa Bay. You know, I'm curious to see how populated our bandwagon has really been. But I've also had like wonderful, elegant experiences like dinners with my dad. And I had a lovely dinner there with Ralph and Carolyn. They're executive producers of Congressional Dish and for sure, they're executive producers. They've been very kind to me on the podcast, but they also became dear friends to Joe and I over dinner at this small restaurant down the corner. And so the 1400 has been that place to me, um, but it's also been the place where I've been kindly and politely asked to leave for being too boozy brunchy with Alexis. <laughs> uh, so I love the 1400 and they've been closed for six weeks. You know, they're selling takeout, but when I think about their customer base, I mean, I haven't bought anything for them because I'm not spending a lot of money right now. My money is dependent on my listeners having money and COVID apocalypse. You know, I don't know what's going to happen with, with my money. It's, it feels like it's going down since all this started. I don't know. Dad will give me my financials eventually, but 
I'm not getting all the Venmo dings that I usually do. And so I'm saving money and eating at home. And I think a lot of other people are too. And I don't really feel bad about that. My ability to save is the reason this podcast exists. My financial survival methods were honed thanks to working in tourism in Hawaii in 2008. (laughs) That tested my skills. And so in times like these, I stopped spending money. And even though I'd like to support all the businesses around me, I think it's smart of me to save my money. And I think a lot of my neighbors are doing the same. And so my favorite Hawaiian flavored restaurant has been closed for six weeks. And as I read this law, I kept thinking, how would or wouldn't these measures help them? And so let's look at the measures in the one money pot that seems to be getting the most coverage, the small business money pot, the payment protection program. So the small business money pot was limited in the CARES Act to $349 billion. And so let's do a quick comparison here. The Steven Mnuchin Federal Reserve fire hose was funded with $500 billion, but that's a fire hose, not a pot, because it can be turned into $4.5 trillion-ish using Fed magic. And I'm pretty sure my friends that own the 1400 bar and grill don't have the Fed on speed dial. So that money is not going to them. But the money pot for small businesses like my 1400 bar and grill friends that was a limited fund of $349 billion. So Mnuchin Fed Big Business Fund, $500 billion, and then trillions on top of it. Small business, $349. $500, $349. So let's just know that right from the start. Big business fire hose got more tax money than the small business by a lot right from the start. So the small business money pot, the rules of it real quick, are that the CARES Act provided $349 billion compared to $500 billion for the Small Business Administration to basically give to small businesses that apply through their banks. Unlike with most of the big business money, the small business money has restrictions on what it can be used for. So it has to be used for employee salaries, tips, sick and vacation time, healthcare, retirement benefits, state and local taxes, and it can be used for some business expenses like rent and utilities. Unlike what is usually the case, sole proprietors and independent contractors are eligible for these small business loans, along with nonprofits and veterans organizations. And the banks are not allowed to require you to give them any collateral if you apply before the end of June. Now, these loans are meant to cover about eight weeks of expenses, which is kind of a problem considering we've been quarantined for six weeks, but okay. And the maximum loan amount is $10 million. As far as paying the loan back is concerned, they can't require you to make payments for at least six months and up to a year, and there's no penalties allowed for prepayment of the loans, but that's if you have to pay it back at all. A lot of this money is going to be kept by the small businesses, which is why people want it so badly, because the loans are eligible for forgiveness, as in you don't have to pay them back if the loan money was used for payroll, interest only, interest only on your mortgage payments. It specifically excludes payments towards the principal on mortgages rent payments or utility payments. So, I mean, for the most part, we're basically paying companies to pay their staffs to do nothing during the quarantines. And what that means to me is that this program has companies acting like the unemployment office, which is presenting problems because if the companies are using the loans to pay their staff to do nothing now, how will they have money to pay their staffs to work when they reopen but haven't had income for months? So it seems to me like it would have been wiser to have the employees who are not working go on unemployment and then have these loans be used for business expenses and restart up costs. But that's just another example of why it's important to have these bills go through committees where these programs can be properly crafted and thought through. It would have been worth an extra week to have Congress do this right. But, you know, vacation. So but anyway, that's the nuts and bolts of how this works. But like I said before, the small business money pot was limited to $349 billion originally compared to the $500 billion not really limited for big businesses. But that unfairness aside, that's still a huge problem because Congress let big businesses legally have access to the small business money too. And so here's the glaringly obvious loophole that allows that to happen. In this law, a small business is defined as a business with fewer than 500 employees per physical location. So first of all, a business with 499 employees is a medium-sized business at best. It's not small. When most of us think of small businesses, we're thinking of the family-owned restaurant down the street with 20 to 30 employees. 
And so for me, I think a 50 employee limit is a small business in my head. It's a nail salon, a hair salon, a dance studio, a pinball museum, or the comic book store. This definition of 500 or less, which we've seen in the past, it's actually pretty standard. 50 or more is medium in my head. And I could negotiate that up to 100, but not 499. That's not a small business. Nope, 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 nope. But then taking it a step further, and this is the first time I've seen this in a lot, is that they called a small business 500 employees per location. And so that opened up the small business money pot up to the corporate titans. So for example, Shake Shack, a New York burger chain that I most recently saw on the Las Vegas Strip, has 7,600 employees spread out amongst its 140 locations in the United States, and it's valued at $1.6 billion. But Shake Shack got $10 million, the maximum allowed for a company, at least in theory, in small business loans because each of their individual stores has fewer than 500 employees, even though the company itself has 15 times that many employees. Potbelly sandwiches, which I've had them in a airport in Chicago. Potbelly got $10 million, despite the fact that they employ 6,000 people. Roots Chris, the fancy ass steakhouse chain with more than 5,000 employees, 441 million in revenue in 2019 and 86 million in cash reserves. They got 20 million, which if you're doing the math on that is twice the supposed limit for one company from this limited money for small businesses. And they got the 20 million instead of 10 by applying through separate Ruth Chris restaurants. Then there's Fogo de Chao, which is a fancy ass Brazilian steakhouse that charges 50 bucks per dinner at its 43 locations that employ at least 3,500 people. They also got $20 million playing the same perfectly legal thanks to Congress game. And the executives at Fogo de Chao don't feel any guilt or shame about it, at least not yet. The Fogo de Chao CEO said to the Wall Street Journal that, quote, the scale of our business doesn't matter, unquote. Well, it does when you're a big business, taking the limited money meant specifically for small businesses. Every dollar that goes to a big business is a dollar that a small business doesn't get. And a proven effective strategy in doing something about it has emerged from this whole saga. Because after it was widely reported that Shake Shack and Roots Chris took millions from the small business money, both restaurant chains announced that they're going to give the money back 100% of bad press and people badgering them on social media, which is good because it works the other way too. Every dollar a big business puts back in the small business money bucket is a dollar that a small business can get. And so from the comfort of our quarantines, we can make a difference by calling out all the other big businesses that are taking small business money. Specifically, we can call them out in writing on social media and be sure to tag them because the whole point is that we want them to see it. But we can think of it as doing our civic duty by talking sh which God knows I'm good at. So, But that's how we as customers in the free marketplace have already shamed the corporate titans into returning some of the money that they were allowed to take from the small business money pot. You can't forget about that. But without legal requirements, without Congress doing their job, social pressure is our next best play. The thing is, we've got to play to win that game. And so let's look at that as an example of something that we have within our power to make some change. And to start, we might want to direct our next effort at the $30 million that Ashford Hospitality Trust has taken so far out of the small business money. And they're expecting more money because 42 of its subsidiaries applied for and were approved for forgivable small business loans. Ashford Hospitality Trust is a publicly traded company. It's a stock market company that owns small, quaint bed and breakfasts such as the Marriott Beverly Hills and the Ritz Carlton in Atlanta. And in case you're wondering, just in case, there is one particular hotel chain that is not cashing in. Thank God. They can't by law. And that's the Trump brand hotel. Because Congress did, or at least the Democrats did, at least, prohibit loans or payments from going to any company that is more than 20% owned by the president, his spouse, or his horrible children or son-in-law, in addition to the vice president, executive department heads, members of Congress, or any of their family members. But that provision was clearly aimed at Trump's orange face, and it was a bullseye. So Trump brands are not doing this. But 
30 million and counting did go to a company to the owner of the Ritz. And that's a company that has other options for needed cash. Because according to the Wall Street Journal, at least 150 publicly traded companies, stock market companies, some with market values well over $100 million, took small business money. A business with over $100 million, again, is not a small business. And publicly traded companies have the ability to sell stock to raise money. Isn't that the point of the stock market? Isn't that the reason why people tell me every time I ask that the stock market needs to exist? Otherwise, large companies wouldn't be able to raise capital, Jennifer, or so. So we need to have the stock market. Well, they have the stock market. They're on it. They can raise capital. They don't need access to the small business fund on top of the fire hose and the stock market. But yet, that's access that they have. The 150 publicly traded companies that took loans that we know of so far have taken about $600 million from the small business loan bucket. And with that money, 6,000 actual small businesses could have gotten $100,000, which might not be enough, but it's certainly better than the nothing they've gotten so far. And actually, might as well tell you this now, if you are that small business owner that would like a $100,000 loan right now, even though you definitely have to pay this one back, you do have an option to borrow from yourself because the CARES Act did waive rules penalizing removing up to $100,000 from your retirement counts if you take the money out before the end of 2020. You're allowed to pay it back in full for three years, starting on the day you took it out with no penalties. But to qualify, you have to self-certify that you're someone who had COVID-19, is caring for a spouse or a dependent who had COVID-19, or someone who is financially screwed in some way due to being quarantined, having your work hours reduced, or having to care for a child. Which I just have to point out the difference here. These big businesses can get money from the Fed or from Steven Mnuchin without any proof of hardship at all. But we need to prove hardship in order to borrow money from ourselves. So thank you, Congress. But that option is there if you want to bet your retirement savings on your small business. You do you. But back to the money that was supposed to be for small businesses. We obviously can't know precisely where the money has gone yet. It hasn't all been passed out. Well, it kind of has, but not really. Because, well, I'll just, I'll jump ahead a little bit. They ran out of small business money. We all know that. So they had to replenish it. So the first chunk is gone. The second chunk hasn't gone out the door yet. But so far, according to an analysis of the Small Business Administration data done by the Wall Street Journal, about 45% of the loans, almost half of them approved by mid-April, were for more than a million dollars, which indicates that larger businesses took a significant percentage of the small business money. And it's not just restaurants and hotels, because those are businesses that, no matter their size, are clearly being hit hard by the COVID-19 social distancing requirements and travel restrictions. But there are other industries that are getting even more money than them. In fact, construction businesses got the largest share of the money, followed by professional services, manufacturing, and social services, which are industries that have at least partially been able to stay open during this crisis. Those industries got $169 billion of the money, which is almost half of what was provided by the original CARES Act. So like Quantum Corp, a data storage company based in Silicon Valley with 800 employees, got $10 million in the small business money. Data storage. Sounds pretty digital to me. Then there's a coal mining company, Halidor Energy. They have 915 employees. They also got $10 million in small business loans. Also, while banks and insurance companies are not eligible for the small business loans, hedge funds, which are investment funds available only to filthy rich people, funds that gamble on Wall Street by the billions and collect fees from the oligarchs for doing so. Well, the people that manage these hedge funds are applying as small businesses because they have fewer than 500 employees employed to gamble for the rich. You know, even hedge fund managers, the most useless of financial bloodsuckers, weren't explicitly prohibited from taking small business money. When I look at the industries, there should have been some kind of proof of harm required because restaurants and hotels have gotten just $30.5 billion of the small business money, less than 10%, despite the fact that these industries got fucked particularly hard. You know, the 1400 bar and grill, those are the businesses that should be getting this money, not a hedge fund manager, not a Silicon Valley company stuffed with 800 tech bros. It's the restaurant on the corner. It's the Lyft driver, the hair salon owner, big business, especially big businesses that didn't have to shut down these last six weeks. They should never have been given access to these funds. And that's not on them. 
You know, we might be mad that they took the money, but it was Congress that allowed them to do that. So we know that Congress obviously committed the original sin of allowing big businesses access to the small business money to begin with. But who actually decided where the money went? Well, that would be the banks, not the government. Because even though this fund is technically managed by the Small Business Administration, technically managed by the government, and Congress could have put the government in charge of directly issuing the loans, they instead decided that the banks should play middlemen between our tax money and us. And so the banks are being paid with our tax money to submit applications to the government in whatever order they choose. Also, if the loan is approved before the fund runs out, it's the bank that decides who gets to have their loans forgiven, also not the government. And the banks are prohibited from being punished if the documentation submitted to them is wrong until June 30th, 2020. So they're really not required to do any due diligence about these loans at all. They can give the loans to just about anybody. And so that's probably how New York City-based Lindbald Expeditions Holdings, a cruise ship and travel company, got a $6.6 million loan, despite the fact that they had $137 million in cash on its balance sheet at the end of March. And so for the banks, there's no risk at all. They can't get in trouble no matter who they give the loan to. On top of that, the federal government guarantees 100% of the loans made between February 15th and June 30th. And the government's going to pay the bankers for the amount of the loan forgiven, plus interest and fees, basically for doing paperwork for our country. As far as those fees are concerned, the government's going to pay the bankers processing fees of 5% for loans under $350,000, 3% for loans between three hundred fifty dollars and $2 million, and 1% for loans over $2 million. And since we don't know how many businesses are going to be approved from each category, we don't know exactly how much money will be funneled to the bankers because they were given this middleman position between our tax money and us. But the absolute minimum is 1%. And so the amount of money made available for these loans is $349 billion, which means that the banks will pocket between $3.5 billion and $17 billion in fees from our tax money. Also, the bankers must be paid within five days of making the loan while we wait for months for our sad-ass stimulus checks. On top of that, banks are allowed to charge up to 4% interest on the loans that they have absolutely no risk in issuing. And as if that wasn't enough profit potential for the banks in all of this, the loans are allowed to be sold by the banks on the secondary market, too. So the banks can immediately throw the hot potato to someone else and collect cash for the full price of the loan that they have no risk for anyway. But remember, these loan payments are allowed to be deferred. And so no required payments of principal, interest, or fees for at least six months and up to a year. But what if the secondary buyer who buys the loan from the bank doesn't want to abide by those terms? Well, then the government can then buy the loan from whoever bought it from the bank. And so the bank can sell the loan and make money. A financial industry investor can then sell it again to our government and make money, with the taxpayers picking up the total bill, including all of the fees that kept passed around in between all of these transactions. And that is such a waste of money. The bankers and investors, the shareholder class, they don't need to be allowed to make money just for moving our loans around. No one needs them to move our loans around. Getting the secondary market involved in any of this is totally unnecessary unless the goal is to allow the shareholder class, financial people who fund campaigns and can afford lobbyists, to siphon money out of this crisis. In fact, if at the end of the cycle it's the government owning the loans anyway, it seems to me that it's unnecessary to let the private bankers be involved at all. I'm sure the Small Business Administration could process the paperwork for less than three and a half to 17 billion if we properly funded our government. We don't need bankers as our middlemen. We are paying bankers to process the loans. They get interest on the loans they assume no risk for, and they can profit from selling the loans. No matter how dire the crisis, the bankers always win. And while the rest of us battle for the pot of small business gold, the bankers also get to choose the winners and losers of our battle. Because the small business money is supposed to be first come, first served. But according to the Small Business Administration, that doesn't mean the first to apply gets the money. It's the first bank that submits the application that determines who gets the money. So banks have the freedom to prioritize the order that they submit the applications. So, for example, Roots Chris got to the front of the line because they had an existing banking relationship with J.P. Morgan Chase. And so they got preference. They got to the front of the line. And customers of J.P. Morgan Chase in particular were really lucky duckies in this race to get the limited money for the small businesses. 
There's a lawsuit that's been filed in California, according to USA Today, alleging that the big banks, including J.P. Morgan Chase specifically, prioritized larger loan applications first, which would give the banks more money because of the percentage-based fee structure. Then, after those were processed, actual small businesses were processed in larger batches, and so those were processed closer to when the money ran out. If this was truly first come, first serve, there wouldn't have been such a big jump in actual small businesses being processed in those last few days. It would have been more even the entire time. But in general, the businesses that got the loans were the businesses that already had accounts at banks that had already had a streamlined process for small business administration loan applications. And in fact, many banks wouldn't even help people who didn't already have an account at their bank. And so if you didn't already have a friendship with a middleman, you were shit out of luck. And so banks, they picked the winners and losers in this race for the first pot of money. And there's also evidence that there's unfairness in the division of the money by state. And that's a problem with the Trump administration's Small Business Administration, which approves the applications. Because actual small businesses in red states, states that have Republican governors that also voted for Trump in 2016, many of them don't even have stay-at-home orders in place and definitely didn't when the law was signed. Well, some of those states had relatively high percentages of their small businesses getting approved for forgivable loans. So, for example, 58% of North Dakota's small businesses were approved, 56 in Nebraska, 48 in Iowa. But in blue states that locked down before the law was signed... In those states, the percentages of small businesses approved has been much lower. So in California and New York, 18% of our small businesses have been approved for loans, 20% in Washington state. And those three states are the first and hardest hit. And the businesses that did get the money on top of, you know, more of them being approved in those red states compared to blue states, they got more money per worker. So businesses in North Dakota, for example, got $8,000 per worker, while California's small businesses averaged $4,600 and New York $5,000. Despite the fact that New York and California wages and costs of living are far, far higher than for those people living in fields in the Dakotas. And so there's a very good chance that there's going to be an investigation of this by the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee when Congress bothers to return from vacation or the Government Accountability Office, probably both. And at least I hope so. And I will be paying attention to this because that really pisses me off. But all of this, no matter who looks into it, is going to be hard to police, even if Congress does decide to come back to work and bothers to try to police any of it, because neither the Trump administration nor the banks are providing the public with a list of companies that have gotten the loans. And they're not providing a list because Congress didn't require them to. And so, like I said, this CARES Act gave $349 billion for small businesses and entirely predictably on April 16th, just three weeks after the law was signed, the money ran out. And so Congress had to come back from vacation for a whole day and pass a short law that added money to the program for a new total of $659 billion. And when they came back to edit the CARES Act, I mean, I've listed a lot of really obvious problems that a dum-dum like me was able to spot quite easily. Well, when Congress came back, they didn't place a single limit on big businesses access to the money. In fact, instead of doing that, they added, quote, agricultural enterprise, unquote, with, quote, not more than 500 employees, unquote, to the list of businesses eligible for the forgivable loans. And so now some pretty big fucking farms can get into the game. The only thing that Congress did do to theoretically get more money to small businesses is that the the follow-up law requires that $30 billion of the new money be loans issued by banks and credit unions with assets between $10 billion and $50 billion, and then $30 billion of the new money has to be issued by banks and credit unions with less than $10 billion in assets. But that just guarantees that the money goes to smaller middlemen, not to smaller businesses. And, of course... 80% of the money, when you do the math, 80% of it goes into the pot of money that the big banks can do the paperwork for and process as they have been for their large favored clients. The loophole that allows big businesses into this fund is so obvious. It's less than 500 employees per location. You change those words and it slams the door on all of this. And Congress didn't bother to change a single substantial thing about this program, despite the fact that this was obvious. The parties aren't hearing us. They don't care. And I'm guessing it's because we're not saying a thing. We really need to be hounding them more on this. Okay, so small businesses are in trouble. A lot of us are in economic trouble. 
And one of the consequences of that is that people might not be able to pay their mortgages and rent. And this law did something about that. And so <laughs> let's get started with the mortgages. Because people with federally backed mortgages, that's important, federally backed mortgages, who have been affected by COVID-19 directly or indirectly can request and must be granted a pause in their loan payments. It's called a forbearance for a maximum of, of about a year. But you have to request it twice. So you have to request it once and then again after the first six months. The customers have to provide no proof of hardship to get this. And so if you're still working, but just don't want to pay your mortgage for a little while, for whatever reason, they can't say no to you, just FYI. And while your payments are on hold, normal interest and fees will still accrue, but they can't charge any extra interest penalties or fees for this. And for everyone, this law prohibits the banks that manage federally backed loans from moving forward with any foreclosure processes until mid-May 2020. And for those of you who keep a track, that's two weeks from this recording, and our quarantine, at least in California here, has been extended until May 15th at least. So what that means is that it's highly likely, with Congress still being on vacation and all, that the banks can start taking people's houses while we're still in the thick of this. We might still literally be in quarantine before this foreclosure moratorium is lifted. And what kills me about that is like, when you look at all the different deadlines, why would they end this in mid-May while well, we're gifting the banks with literally billions of dollars in fees and interest on all of those risk-free business loans for years? Because in all of the provisions handing out corporate favors, the end dates were when the emergency is over or either the end of July or the end of the year, whichever is later. I saw that over and over and over again. But the provision that lets us stay in our homes, done in mid-May, hard out. Because God forbid the banks collect less money from peasants. It's not like there's a fire hose of money in the hands of the Federal Reserve that can keep the banks sitting pretty. Oh, wait, wait, I'm pretty sure there is. So yeah, the foreclosure machine will gear back up while quarantine round one is probably still in effect. So there's problem number one. And there are other glaring problems here too. All of these provisions only apply to people with federally backed mortgages. And that's only about half of mortgages. And that's according to David Dian, who I trust more than anyone on mortgage-related information and who is writing a newsletter every day for the American Prospect on all of this stuff. He has been one of the most amazing resources for information. And you can find a bunch of his articles in the show notes. I'm subscribed to his newsletter. Follow him on Twitter, David Day, and he is incredible. But the point is that about half the people with mortgages can still be foreclosed on even during the super short foreclosure ban window. So that's problem number two. And then there's problem number three, and this is a biggie. Congress put nothing in this law telling banks what they can and cannot do after the moratorium is over. The decisions are left completely up to the banks. And many banks have decided that, yes, they are legally required to let you pause your payments. But the minute your pause is over, you have to pay everything you owned during that pause all at once. And I feel like the appropriate response to this was expressed by a New Yorker sitting in his car who has nicknamed himself Ticked Off Vic on his YouTube page. You want to help? Here's one idea. Tell the f***ing banks and mortgage companies to stop all mortgage payments at this time. Just stop them. And don't give me that three-month furlough bullshit. How does that even make sense? So someone who lost their job because you said to stay at home doesn't pay mortgage for three months, but in the fourth month they have to not only pay that month that's due, but also the three months they owed in full because it was furloughed? How the f*** does that help, you greedy c suckers? Someone was just unemployed and not earning money for three months. They weren't earning money! Hello? Now they just start back to work and all that money magically appears so they can pay the three months in a lump sum. How are they f***ing paying that? Are you f***ing idiots? Look, it almost makes sense that they can start paying the current mortgage due for the month when they go back to work. But they can't pay the prior three months? They had no income! So here's the idea. Just add the three f***ing months of the furlough to the back end of the loan. So if they have, let's say, 19 years and six months left in their mortgage, just add the three months. So now they have 19 years and nine months. How f***ing hard is that? You'll get your money, you bags. It's just delayed. The working stiff wins if you do that. It really helps. It actually helps. But Congress didn't listen to Vic and make that a requirement for mortgages or any other payment when they had the chance this week. They also didn't extend the moratorium beyond mid-May. And so when they do come back from their f***ing vacation, they'll have about a week to extend the foreclosure moratorium or it's over and the foreclosure machine revs back up again. And the machine will have lots of homes to foreclose on once millions of Americans who are forced to stay home from work are forced to pay two, four, six months of mortgage payments all at once with money they don't have. 
So that's single family homes. What about apartment buildings? Well, when it comes to like being a landlord, people that own multifamily housing units with five or more units with federally backed mortgages, again, this only applies to those that have federally backed mortgages. Well, they can request and must be granted a pause in their loan payments too. But their pause is a lot shorter. They can only get a pause for a total of 90 days and Congress is making apartment owners jump through a bunch of hoops to get this pause. So to get the 90-day pause, people have to request it three times, once for every 30 days. So the way this works is like, if you're an apartment owner, you have like six units, you have to ask your bank first to get your first 30 days. They have to give it to you. To get the next 30 days, you have to request again, but you have to do it 15 days in advance. So that means that the person that owns this little apartment complex will have to remember to beg their banker for the pause again within the next two weeks after they had just done it. And if that person goes to the bank just a few days before the deadline, the bank can be like, oh, sorry, man, you called too late. Give us your mortgage payment right now, even though we know your tenants can't pay you. But if the landlord is really on top of their shit and they do request it 15 days in advance and gets the next 30 days, then they get to request another 30 days. But again, make sure you do it 15 days in advance or no pause for you. And after the 90 days is up, the landlord is straight f- pay up and pay in full. Although that's not part of the law. That's just what the bankers are making people do. The pay in full part, Congress didn't tell them they can't do that. And so the bankers are. And so landlords, even relatively small ones, five units or more, are jumping through lots of hoops to get a three-month pause in their mortgage payments with a balloon payment possible at the end of it, even if they aren't getting paid by their tenants who can't pay their rent. On top of that, the CARES Act then puts a moratorium on evicting tenants that lasts essentially through late July, but only for landlords, again, with federally backed mortgages, and they aren't allowed to charge late fees. And so all of these provisions are only for people with federally backed mortgages, but let's line these dates up. So like I said, I'm a landlord. I have six apartments. I saved up for years. I bought this building and it's like a Melrose Place type situation. Have a great building. Most of my tenants are relatively young. They're my friends. One is a bartender. One's a hairdresser. One's an actor. One's a flight attendant. One is this great girl that owns a daycare and one's a stripper. She's beautiful. We love her. We don't judge. None of them are working their full hours right now. Most of them can't work at all, and all of them are having trouble paying rent. Maintaining this building that I saved up for years to buy is my full-time job, and I'm not getting paid either because they can't pay me. And so right before April 1st, right after the CARES Act became law, I asked for my 90 days pause in my mortgage payments. And I'm on top of my shit. So 15 days later, I got my next 30 days. Then I did it again. 30 days. So 30 days for April. 30 days for May, 30 days for June, July 1, 90 days are up. But at the end of June, the best case scenario is that quarantine's been partially lifted maybe for maybe a month. That's the best case scenario. But my tenants are still behind on their payments because they weren't working for months. They have to make up some payments too. But now it's July 1st and my balloon payment is due and I'm not allowed to evict any of these people, even if I wanted to, until August in order to get some paying tenants. So balloon payment after no income due July 1st plus no evictions allowed until August equals foreclosure. And again, this is precisely the type of thing that gets discussed and fixed when bills are crafted carefully in committees the way they're supposed to. Or if that's too much to ask of Congress, when the bills are available to fucking read for more than an hour before the vote. But this kind of stupidity is what happens when a bill is written behind closed doors by three dudes and then the Senate and the House pass it without giving it a look. But again, when the small business money ran out, Congress amended the CARES Act. And did they do anything about this situation? No. And again, all of that only applies to landlords with federally backed mortgages, which are only about a quarter of all apartment buildings. Landlords with private mortgages aren't guaranteed to be allowed to pause their payments, which sucks for them. But they're also free to evict their tenants at any time, at least federally allowed. Some cities and states have stepped into this void and put restrictions in place. But for renters, the CARES Act didn't do shit for 75% of us. 
And so to find out if you're protected from eviction until August-ish, at least federally protected, it has nothing to do with your situation, but is instead 100% based on what bank the owners of your building do business with. So to find out if the federal renter eviction moratorium is applicable to you, you need to be that awkward weirdo that calls the owner of your building and is like, uh, hi, um, this is Jen in apartment 326. Um, what bank do the owners of this building have their mortgage with? Oh, you're just a leasing agent? Well, is the property manager there? Yeah, I can totally wait. Thanks. Hi, this is Jen in apartment 326. Where did the owners of this building get their mortgage? Oh, the owners are random investor people in San Francisco and you don't know them? Well, do you have their number? Oh, there's lots of numbers. Well, do you know who would know what bank holds the investor's mortgage? Oh, you have no f***ing clue? Well, that makes sense. Yes, I will totally go f*** myself now. Have a great day. I'm so sorry I called. <laughs> I mean, honestly, for those of us in really large apartment buildings, which I am, our time is better spent finding a large refrigerator box to move into than trying to figure out which company holds the mortgage for this place. I, I honestly don't even know where to start. And I used to work in a building like this. So yeah, bottom line, at every turn, banker interests trumped ours. Mortgage pauses are required, but there's hoop jumping and balloon payments await us at the end of them. And to make sure the landlords can pay their private loans, the vast majority of us can be evicted if we're renters as far as Congress is concerned. Congress has totally failed us here. But while Congress is failing to protect us, there are other humans that have been legit heroes during covid apocalypse, and they are obviously our healthcare workers, our angels on Earth. So how did the CARES Act help them help us to keep breathing and stay alive? Well, when I look at the healthcare situation, one infuriating phenomenon that desperately needs legal fixing right now is one that I highlighted in the beginning of the Thank You Doctors bonus thank you episode that I just released when one of our producers, a doctor, wrote in to tell us that he and damn near everyone he's working with are getting pay cuts in the middle of this pandemic. Of all people in the middle of a global health crisis, you would think that the people taking care of sick people would at least not have to worry about their finances, that they would get pay cuts since they're working all the time saving lives. But uh, that's not the case here. And what we're witnessing is a consequence of our privatized healthcare system. Because in other countries, in general, I know I'm being basic here, but in other countries, taxes pay for a national healthcare system. Doctors and hospitals are strategically located and funded. And if the people in the community are healthy and the doctors sometimes have a slow period, that's a good thing. Healthy people is considered a good thing. But our system is different. We make doctors and hospitals fend for themselves. They need sick people because they need to be paid. Because here in these United States, healthcare is business. And right now, in most of the country, elective surgery. So things like knee replacements, things that can wait. And actually things like cancer treatments, which really shouldn't wait. Well, they're all being delayed until after this pandemic is over for health reasons. The idea is that they don't want people who don't have COVID-19 coming to hospitals overrun with extremely contagious COVID-19 patients and then catching COVID-19 themselves. Medically, this makes sense to me. But the way our system is structured, the hospitals are losing money on the surgeries that they aren't performing, on the preventative checkups that they aren't doing, on the emergency room visits that are not happening. Ironically, hospitals need us to be sick and they need us to hurt ourselves and they need us to do it a lot. They need unhealthy people. Sickness and unhealthiness is profit in the United States. And so to make up for some of this, the CARES Act provided $100 billion in grants, which is straight cash. These are not loans. They don't have to pay them back. But that's cash that can go to public, private and for profit healthcare providers in reimbursements from the government. Then this week, the new law added $75 billion on top of that. So again, let's do a quick comparison. $500 billion that will be magically turned into trillions for Steven Mnuchin and the Fed to loan and hand out to big businesses that don't have to prove that they've been harmed, and $175 billion for healthcare providers in a healthcare crisis. Priorities. But whatever. $175 billion. Well, how will that be divided? Well, it's up to regulations that are going to be written by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So we just have to trust that Alex Azar, the loyal Republican stooge turned pharmaceutical company CEO, we just have to trust that he's going to ensure that the money goes to doctors because Congress mandated nothing. They left it to the Trump administration again. And here's just one example of why that's a big problem. 
as we learned in the surprise medical bills episode. Seriously, listen to it. Emergency rooms are often staffed by outside private companies. That's why when you go into an in-network emergency room, you often end up with an out-of-network ER doctor, they don't tell you this, but that's the case, who charges you separately and out-of-network for thousands of dollars. Surprise! Well, those private for-profit medical staffing companies have been giving our heroes, our ER doctors, pay cuts because fewer people are coming into ERs right now for anything that's not COVID. And while that's good for the number of hospital beds and like logic, don't we want fewer people in the emergency room in general? Well, for the private for-profit doctor shops, that's bad for business. And so doctors are getting pay cuts from their bosses during a pandemic. Some of the largest companies that staff emergency rooms are owned at the top by investors, by private equity firms that exist only to buy companies and squeeze every drop of profit out of them that they can. For example, Envision Healthcare is a company that has captured 27,000 doctors in the United States, and at the top of their corporate structure is a private equity firm called KKR, which has two co-founders worth $5.6 billion and $5.8 billion. That firm bought out companies that staffed emergency rooms and anesthesiologists in particular, betting that because patients, because us suckers, don't get to choose those doctors when we go to hospitals, they figured that they could exploit the out-of-network loopholes, make thousands per patient in surprise medical bills, and profit. And you know what? Up until now, it's worked. So good for you, goes Your bet paid off. Until it didn't. Until a pandemic stopped the just-in-case ER visits and elective surgeries, leaving a lot of ER doctors and anesthesiologists with nothing to do. Now, in other countries, those doctors are being simply shifted over to where they're needed in the hospital. But our system is broken up, piecemeal, and private, and so we have healthcare professionals who are basically wandering empty hospitals. And I like to think that they're banging each other in supply closets, but that's Probably because I watch too much Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> but finally, the evil private equity bet on surprise medical bills from ER doctors and anesthesiologists has gone bad for the investors. Karma, bitches. They profit in the good times, but they're not supposed to in the bad, right? Free market, right? That's what the Republicans in Congress have been telling us they believe in this whole time. Democrats too, for that matter. And so these billionaires will have to use some of their money on their companies or they're going to lose the companies, right? No, not in the corporate states of America. And the reason that we know this is the American College of Emergency Physicians, the lobbying group for the private equity companies that bought our ER doctors, sent a letter to HHS Secretary Alex Azar asking for $3.6 billion to emergency room staffing companies and their billionaire investor owners. And there's evidence that their wishes are being granted, no strings attached. The company, for example, that I highlighted in the surprise medical bills episode, HCA, has already gotten $700 million of our tax money, according to their chief financial officer. This money does not need to be repaid, and no surprise billing protections were included in any of the COVID-19 response laws so far, despite the fact that their practice of billing us for out-of-network doctors at in-network hospitals is well known in this Congress. That's what that entire episode was about. And this wouldn't bother me so much if I knew for sure, like if it were law or something, that the money would have to go to the doctor's paychecks and benefits and not to executives and stockholders. But those protections don't exist in this law either. These companies are doing what for-profit companies do, exploiting every opportunity to profit. The problem is that Congress is letting them. In good times, they're collecting on surprise medical bills, they win. In bad times, they get government money, they win. They always fucking win. And this time, it's not just taxpayers who lose, it's the doctors too. This healthcare system, this privatized healthcare system, eats everyone who isn't at the top of it. And so, yeah, the CARES Act gives Alex Azar $175 billion to pass out how he pleases. And now it's been a month, and so some of the money has been passed out. And in a system that makes sense, you would think that the payments would be based on the hospitals that have the most COVID-19 burdens. But that's not how Azar has so far chosen to hand out the money. Instead, the first $30 billion Azar decided to hand out based on the hospital share of revenue from the Medicare program. Because basically in our privatized system, Medicare is one of the only parts of our healthcare system that the federal government has reliable information about and a payment system set up for. Where healthcare is privately managed, it's private. There's a break in the chain in the system when it comes to oversight and the ability to quickly process payments. 
in significant portions of our healthcare system. It's private. And so it's not connected to the government at all. And so the government is using the piece of the system that they do have, and that's Medicare. And so payments are being dispersed to hospitals based on how many old people they treat, not how many COVID-19 patients they treat. And the result is that states such as Minnesota, Nebraska, and Montana, which really haven't been hit too hard by COVID-19, have gotten more than $300,000 per reported COVID-19 case. While New York, which as of this recording is far and away the epicenter of the outbreak in the United States, has gotten $12,000 per case. $300,000 versus $12,000 per COVID-19 case. That's too big a discrepancy. And so how will Azar choose to hand out the remaining $70 billion? We don't know. And Congress is still on vacation, and so there's no hearings taking place to find out. Separate from the hospital money, there are also other entities in the United States that are doing some amazing, important work when it comes to COVID-19. Those are our community health care centers. So the CARES Act did add $1.5 billion, so crumbs, to the funding for community health centers, which might sound okay. At least they got something, right? Except that all that did was bring the funding equal to their 2019 funding because community health centers, they had their funding cut this year. And so while Potbelly Sandwiches got $10 million and the company that owns the Ritz-Carlton got $30 million and Boeing got $17 billion, our community health centers didn't get a penny more than they got in 2019 when none of this was happening. The only extra money that the community health centers got are only the ones that are doing testing for COVID-19, and all of them combined have to split $1.32 billion. And you know what? While we're talking about testing, let's do this now. In episode 212, I told you about the provisions that provide coverage for COVID-19 tested, and I spotted a loophole, which is that doctor's visits are only covered if a test is ordered. If there are no tests available, which is still a case in a lot of places, if there is no test available and your doctor doesn't order a test in writing, your insurance company might be able to get out of covering the visit. And the CARES Act didn't close that loophole, so I still recommend that even if there is no test available, I think you should ask your doctor to order one in writing just to cover your ass. But I looked into it because the new tests that are all the rage are the antibody tests because I think damn near all of us have convinced ourselves at some point during quarantine that we definitely had COVID-19 this winter because, like, remember that one time I coughed? (laughs) Well... Some good news is that the Trump administration has announced that the antibody tests will be considered COVID-19 tests, and therefore the insurance company has to cover you at no cost to you. But again, if there is no test, make sure you ask your doctor to write down that they wanted one for you anyway so you don't get dinged for the visit when the health insurance underwriters inevitably spot the same loophole that I did. You also might want to know that the CARES Act is requiring that the Secretary of Health and Human Services be notified about the result of every test, regardless of that result, until the end of this emergency. And I don't know what information about us is being transferred and if it's personally identifiable. It might be. So just know that, especially as they continue to look at innovative tech solutions like apps that alert everyone around you that you had the plague. And as far as surveillance is concerned, this is the most eyebrow-raising provision that I saw, and it's just something to keep in mind if you're concerned about the government having that information about you. Personally, I'm not, but some of you are, so there you go. And now, to top off this episode, I swear to God, we're almost done. I know this is a long one, but here is a hodgepodge of random shit that was interesting enough to mention. So, first up, my ladies, it took until 2020. But the federal government has finally acknowledged that Shark Week requires medical care. And so starting at the beginning of this year, so dig up those receipts out of the trash, but us ladies can use the money in health savings accounts to pay for our period products. And this one is permanent. This is a dingleberry that had jack shit to do with COVID-19, but you know what? I'll take it. And speaking of private parts, your kids might not be given information on how to use them, because the CARES Act also extends abstinence-only education through November, which also has nothing to do with COVID-19. And I just find it fascinating that the Republicans used a health care crisis to limit health care education to, you know how your PP keeps standing up when you see a lady? Yeah, just ignore that. That'll work. <laughs> like, that's not education. <laughs> but that's what we do in the United States. And while we're on the topic of students who are learning nothing right now, there were some provisions for students in the CARES Act. 
So first up, the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, is required to suspend all payments due for student loans until September 30th of this year. Interest is not allowed to continue to accrue during the suspension time, but you're allowed to keep making payments towards your principal. And so if you are still working, this might be a really good time to like get rid of some of those student loans. Also, the CARES Act allows your boss to pay for some of your student loans, either the principal and or the interest tax free if the payment is made before next year. I don't know why your boss would do this, but there you go. And this can be done regardless of if the business was in any way affected by COVID-19. And so maybe if you're in a situation where your boss wants to you know, screw around with his taxes a little bit, like, I don't know, but that just, I found that interesting that that is allowed temporarily. Also, colleges are temporarily given the ability to help students too. They will be allowed to use some of their federal grant money for students facing, quote, unexpected expenses and unmet financial need, unquote. The student can be given up to the maximum federal Pell Grant for this year, which is currently $6,345. So talk to the administrators of your school if you're financially fucked because of COVID. Also, the semester that students with loans couldn't finish because of COVID-19 is not going to be counted towards your lifetime limits on your subsidized loan or your Pell Grants. And <laughs> the last one, another favor to some corporations, but colleges including the for-profit kind that have students with loans who withdraw from their schools due to COVID-19, they're not going to have to repay the money that they received from that student, even if it is our tax money. And the students don't have to return the money either. So this does funnel taxpayer money to colleges, for-profit colleges, for literally nothing. Speaking of paying for nothing, the CARES Act also allows more sales from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And this one's weird. So for those of you who haven't been following this with me for the last, I don't know, 2015, it's 25 years, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve was created in the mid-1970s after the cartel that controls global oil cut off supply, which led to oil shortages in the United States. Determined not to be screwed like that again, we created four giant tanks of oil in underground salt mines along the Gulf of Mexico, which is basically like the United States oil savings account to be used in cases of emergency. Now, thanks to some of the other laws that we've seen pass recently by fiscally reckless Congresses, the government is required to sell off quite a bit of our emergency oil stockpile from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So like the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015, that was signed in November 2015. That's the first time I saw this. Then there was the FAST Act, which is a transportation funding law signed a month later. That also got rid of some of our oil. The 21st Century Cures Act, which was a giant favor to the pharmaceutical industry. I highlighted that in episode 145. That sold more oil. And then they did it again in a government funding law. And at this point, I've lost track of the total amount of barrels we're supposed to sell, but I know it's at least 350 million at this point. And this law does it again. But instead of requiring that it be sold by the barrel, what the CARES Act does is it gives the Department of Energy the authority to sell $900 million worth of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So that's $450 million in, 21, in 2021 and 2022 on top of the $450 million that they're supposed to sell in 2020 for a total of $1.35 billion of oil. So what this tells me is that members of Congress clearly want to deplete our oil reserves, our emergency oil. And I don't understand it, especially considering the Trump administration is not asking for this. In fact, they're trying to do the exact opposite. Because in mid-March, two days after Trump went on TV and f***ed up announcing the European travel ban, he ordered the Department of Energy to buy enough oil to refill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which actually makes a lot of sense to me. Because the price of oil has plummeted. Not only has COVID-19 quarantines crushed global travel, there are far fewer airplanes and cars burning through fossil fuels right now, but also Saudi Arabia and Russia have been waging a oil price war, flooding the market with oil that no one's trying to buy. And so now is a really good time to buy. But Congress wouldn't approve that purchase, and so the Department of Energy canceled it already. Instead, the Department of Energy announced they're going to let private oil companies store their oil in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve since Congress is refusing to let the government refill our emergency supply and because the private sector has so much oil right now and so few people want it that they literally don't know what to do with it. And because of that situation, oil price, even since then, has gone to a ridiculously low level. 
On Monday, April 20th, the price of oil per barrel was negative for the first time in history. They couldn't give the stuff away because no one knows where to store it. And so far, no one has added any oil to the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. But one thing is for sure, at this moment in time, selling our oil is not an option. There are no buyers. And I know that members of Congress are not wizards who can see the future. They couldn't know that the price of oil would go negative for the first time in history less than a month after they wrote this law. But on March 27th, the price of oil was still only $25 per barrel. It was well over 100 during the W. Bush years. And so to sell over $1.3 billion of oil, we'd have to sell 54 million barrels of oil in a market that was clearly already crashing. They wanted us to sell low and sell a lot. The Republicans, in their version of the CARES Act that died, did provide the Energy Department with $3 billion to refill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So what that tells me is that this is a Democrat thing. And I, for the life of me, I don't know what they're thinking. I researched it for too long. Honestly, it was, it was quite a rabbit hole. But I, I don't know what this is. And if anyone has information to share, I'd love to know why the Democrats keep insisting on emptying the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. In keeping with the theme of, I don't know what the Democrats are thinking, this CARES Act also provides $400 million to prepare for the 2020 federal election cycle, domestically or internationally. But there's no direction on how the money is divided among states. So that means that the Trump administration was given $400 million to divide, as it sees fit, for election things. But you know, as Nancy Pelosi always says, Donald Trump has proven time and time again that he's an honorable man. He would never lie. He's always fair. He has no vendettas against the Democrats. You know, he has nothing but respect for the Obama Biden administration. And so he would never do anything unfair to his 2020 opponent, Joe Biden. Trump can be trusted with 400 mil to secure the election. We have nothing to worry about. I mean, since Pelosi and Schumer and the Democrats let this money be divided among the states by Trump, they clearly think he can be trusted. Or maybe they didn't read the bill. But in all seriously, what the f***? The only reason that this isn't a really big deal is because in the grand scheme of things, it's not that much money. We're going to need billions to secure our elections. We know that, especially since the national vote by mail is looking more and more necessary by the day. And so the good news is that this isn't enough for the Trump administration to do much damage. But it also isn't enough to do any good, especially with no requirements attached. It's just with enemies like these, <laughs> who even needs friends, you know, the Democrats, they're just letting Trump do whatever the f*** he wants. It's insane. And by the way, if Congress fails, which they very much might, at making vote by mail national by November, and you have to risk your health to vote in person this year, well, when you go to vote, at least you won't have to show a real ID because the requirements that we all get a new real ID driver's license, which you really only need to use to fly on airplanes. But we were supposed to have these new fancy IDs by October 1st of this year. Well, that's been extended to October 1st of next year, 2021. And the Real ID Act passed into law in 2005. So what's another year? It's only been 16. <laughs> And speaking of flying, let's take a quick trip into the CARES Act money that will fly around the world because the CARES Act provides $3 billion to the World Bank, $7.3 billion for the African Development Bank, and authorizes the Treasury, quote, to make loans in an amount not to exceed the dollar equivalent, $28,202,470,000 of special drawing rights, unquote which is approximately $38.5 billion as of April 21st, 2020. And special drawing rights are like a world trade system phony baloney currency thing. But yeah, $38.5 billion just kind of snuck right in there for, for world government. And actually, when you total it all up, that means that we have $1.5 billion for our community health centers in the U.S. that do COVID-19 testing. No extra money for those that don't. But we have over $50 billion in total to loan out, probably won't get much of it back, to the black hole of world government. So <laughs> just know that that's a black rabbit hole for another day. I, I couldn't even begin to figure out what that was all about. 
But the bottom line, now that we're pretty much done with CARES Act, is that this was not the worst bill that could have become law, especially considering the way it became law. But big picture, small businesses, as we all know from just being in America right now, are in trouble. A lot of them, our favorite restaurants, hair salons, nail salons, they've been closed and they're having trouble getting money. And at the same time, this law, via money that flows from our pockets to the Treasury or out of thin air from the Fed, is being firehosed by the trillions to the big companies. The big companies have access to shitloads of cash, and small companies don't. Because even the smaller pot of money that's supposed to be for small businesses is going to big businesses. And so what happens next? Monopoly. We've all played it. We know how this works. The players with the money buy the properties of the players that don't. The big fish eat the little fish. And unless there's a bill that becomes law in the near future that evens the playing field for small businesses and doesn't funnel any of the money to big businesses, there's going to be a feeding frenzy. Private equity vultures and wannabe monopolies have multiple ways to get cash. They have the treasury, the Fed, their banking relationships, the stock market, and they are circling the small businesses. They smell the blood of people like you and I just people that had a dream. They wanted to open a little restaurant, but now they're going broke. And so a lot of people are going to sell their businesses for much needed cash to keep their families in their homes, especially since Congress did nothing to help us keep our homes either. Looking at the amount of money that will go to the big businesses, the Wall Street businesses via multiple sources of cash compared with the small amount of money for all small businesses combined, which they have to share with big businesses. I just don't see how there isn't an enormous transfer of wealth and assets to the big business titans when the COVID lace dust is settled. You know, we've been documenting our descent into oligarchy for many years now. And with this law, this law might seal the deal. But the thing is that this story isn't written yet. I'm recording this still quarantined. In fact, I need to take a shower. It's been a while. (laughs) But as I record this, quarantine's still happening. Congress is still on vacation. And so we have the option to turn off Netflix for just a little while and write some letters, make some calls and post on social media. We can make our demands. We can make them at our congressmen and senators. We have to tell them what we want. And the first thing on my list of things that I think we desperately need and immediately is actually... I think national vote by mail, getting set up and having that secured, I think that is the first thing that we need because we need the ability to fire this Congress. We need to keep our ability to choose our leaders. We have to maintain that right. And what I love about this is that vote by mail, and I say this as a Californian that has used it for years on both ends. I'm a voter and a poll worker. It's a wonderful system. It works. Even without the post office, you guys, because you can go into your local election office, get your ballot, and then walk it into the poll place. So you don't really have to, even if they f*** the post office, which I know the Republicans are dying to do on behalf of FedEx and UPS, but even if they don't save the post office, we can still have a system where you get your ballot ahead of time and you walk it in and drop it off. No lines. It's still better. And the best part about that system is that voting machines are impossible to inject in the middle of it. It has to be paper and paper can't be hacked. But I'm beyond the idea that this Congress, this particular Congress, I'm not saying Congress in general. I still believe in the institution elected by the people. We're just doing a really bad job with it because we've elected the same people and over and over again who have proved over and over again they suck at their jobs. And so this Congress, these particular 535 people, I don't think that this Congress can be fixed. But Congress itself can be fixed by replacing the people in it. Because as angry as I am that this Congress is on vacation that they abandoned us to be ruled exclusively by the Trump administration during this crisis with no oversight. At this point, I almost want them to stay on vacation so they can't do any more damage. Because now that I've read it, now that I know what's in the CARES Act, I know that it's almost guaranteed to give the corporate titans even more power in this country. It's guaranteed to make an unequal society even more so. And so my number one suggestion for how we fix this, even though I've seen all these flaws in the law, but I think the number one thing that we need to call and demand is that we need to make sure that we can vote securely this November, because the way this bill was crafted, the way this bill divided our assets, the fact that Congress pieced out for weeks after passing, it's all unforgivable. They all have to go. And so, yeah, number one, 
I would love to see us demand vote by mail so that we can just fire them all. That would be the best thing that we could push for. But since they likely are coming back, I would also like to see the small business loophole closed, you know, because small business is not 500 employees or less per location. At the very least, the per location has got to go. We need to make small business small again. And we also need banks to be required to listen to ticked off Vic. His idea is good. It should be illegal for the banks to have balloon payments at the end of this. Instead, the bank should be required to tack on the pauses to the end of the loans, pauses in mortgages, but also payments for credit cards and car payments, all of them. You know, we bailed out the fucking banks and they have access to the Fed money this time, too. They'll get their money from us. They'll just get it later. It's fair and it will help. And so I'll be calling my members of Congress on Monday and probably Tuesday and Wednesday. I'm going to badger the shit out of them. Because I want this idea floating around their offices when they get back to work, whenever that may be. Because before I wrap this up, I want to pick up with ticked off Vic. This is how he ended his rant. There could be a real plan in place, a real plan to get people through these next few months, a real plan to be testing, a real plan to allow workers who are considered non-essential to not worry about catching a virus and losing their house. Do you do the right fucking thing, you peckerheads, having to tell the government what to do because they have their heads in their asses? That's what fucking ticks me off. But telling the government what to do, that's our jobs. And that's what we've seemed to have forgotten. It may tick us off that it's necessary, but it's necessary. These people don't know what the f*** to do. That much is clear. And so it's up to us to tell them. We can't just complain. We have to tell them what we want. We have to tell them what we want, what we really, really want. (laughs) But seriously, you're not going to get what you want if you stay silent. And this is what staying silent has gotten us so far. And so are you ready to pick up the phone yet? Because the staffs in Congress, in the Senate and the House, they're all still working. They're all still answering calls. But if we can get just two things changed in the CARES Act, if small business can be defined as small business so they can actually get the money that's supposed to go to them and it doesn't get diverted to big business, and if banks can be prohibited from requiring that all the mortgage money be given to them all at once after the pauses... Those two things can help millions of Americans keep their businesses and their homes so that we don't have another foreclosure wave like we did the last time we were in a similar situation in 2008. And you have the power to plant those seeds, to tell your congressmen's pecker heads from your couch that that's what you want them to do. I'm just saying it's an option. I'm just saying that I'm not powerless. I'm just saying that you're not powerless. All I know is that I, for one, am not going to just watch this happen without playing my part to try to help and telling them what to do. I do think that that can help. They all are just peckerheads running around like chickens with their peckerheads cut off. They have no clue what to do. I can tell them. And so I am finally done with the CARES Act. I'm so excited. I'm so ready to be done with this. <laughs> But again, if you learned anything or enjoyed this episode at all, please share it and pay for it if you can. Whatever amount over zero dollars that you think is fair is fair to me. And like I said about a hundred times, Congress is on fucking vacation and has been on vacation for weeks. And so for Congressional Edition, I don't know what's coming next. But thanks to the producers of this show, I will be watching and filling you in as the madness unfolds. And so thanks again to everyone that's on my team. Every single person who has helped produce any episode of the show. I'd like to also thank Mike and Daryl at Pro Podcast Solutions. They are great editors and I'm, (laughs) this is a long one. So thank you. I'd like to thank Brian. He does the artwork for every episode and he crushed it for this one. So we have t-shirts available with this episode's artwork. There's a few episodes in there, but this one for sure, because this episode is so good. So we have the t-shirts, the mugs, the reusable bags, all kinds of swag in the Congressional Dish store. So check that out. And so, yeah, thank you, Brian, for killing it on all the episodes, but this one in particular. I'd like to thank my sister, Lauren, my business manager and therapist. I'd like to thank my dad, my tax manager. Still haven't finished my taxes, but we will one of these days. And that's not his fault. That's totally my fault. I'd like to thank Joe, my love, who has put up with me ranting about the CARES Act for weeks and being a terrible wife who has done nothing but work while he did everything around the house for the last month. So, yeah, CARES Act. 
we're done. We're done. But hopefully Congress isn't done. Hopefully they, they dive back in and actually fix it when they come back. So that's where my hope lies. I also hope that you stay healthy and you're enjoying the downtime that quarantine has blessed us with. I hope you find the silver linings because they're there if you look. Like even with the CARES Act. It's not the Patriot Act. Yay! <laughs> anyway, mwah. talk to you soon. Bye. We don't have a domestic spying program. They're content to fight in black and white despite the many in between. We got a president who plays with the facts. What the facts? And then he waves a flag to cover his tracks. As if a lie is alright, if the end will justify the means. Now we are so damn tired of being. The polar ice caps aren't going away. We don't think we can deny it anymore. You can stick to your story if you think it lies. But we're not keeping quiet anymore. We are so damn tired of being lied. Government jobs consume the profits of the private sector. We don't think we can deny it anymore. bills represent common sense, bipartisan solutions that actually solve problems.